Are you guys ready? Mm-hmm. Matthew, are you ready? Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is David Catania. I'm chairman of the Committee on uh, Education. Uh, today is April 18th. We're in room 120 of the John Wilson Building. Uh, and we're here today to uh, have a public roundtable on the District of Columbia Comprehensive Assessment System Testing Integrity Report uh, for school year 2011 and 2012 and testing integrity generally in the District of Columbia. Uh, this here, this roundtable, rather, was called with rather short notice. And so I really appreciate uh, the fact that members, uh, the, the witnesses, have been able to accommodate uh, this committee by rearranging their schedules and being here on short notice. It's especially true of the two witnesses before us, our Inspector General Charles Willoughby and our Chancellor Kaya Henderson. Uh, it's certainly um, the, 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 the focus of today's hearing will be somewhat limited. It will be to update the population as to where we are on what has been a, sequential, a sequence of allegations as it relates to testing integrity issues generally, uh, and with a special emphasis on a recent report from a, a gentleman by the name of Sandy Sanford that surfaced uh, in the media last week. This was a January 30, 2009 um, uh, internal memo that has uh, sparked the curiosity, to say the least, of some in the, the city with respect to testing integrity. Uh, let me say from the onset, what I intend to do is to, to read the timeline as I understand it and ask uh, that the Inspector General and the Chancellor you know, simply make notes as to where there might be uh, a misunderstanding, a disagreement, or things that we might fill in. I think this is helpful to give the population a chronology of what has happened over the last few years as it relates to testing integrity. I want to be clear, at least from my perspective, what this hearing uh, is not intended to do. Uh, this hearing is not intended to simply kick up additional smoke and to call the reputations <coughs> and integrity of government officials into question simply because uh, there is an interest in on the part of some in the media to continue what is, uh, you know, a, a story uh, affecting many cities at this point, the issue of testing integrity. Uh, I hope that what we learn today will certainly differentiate what is going on in the District of Columbia from the more serious allegations that we see in other parts of the country, and most importantly, in Philadelphia and Atlanta. Uh, my general impressions are that that the the uh, that, that, that we do not have an airtight system, and that we did not have an airtight system from the beginning. And this is partly a function of the fact that you know the No Child Left Behind, which unleashed you know, three quarters of a million dollars, or of a billion dollars on testing nationwide uh, did not come with the type of technical support and financial support uh, that would ensure testing integrity of these uh, state assessments that are required by federal law. And as a result, in jurisdictions where there, uh, where there are challenges with respect to testing after decades of neglect with public education, uh, there is a, uh, undoubtedly there is an incentive to try to make these test scores uh, look better at times than they are. And I think that is on display across this country, especially in districts that have had historically underperforming systems. So um, what are my impressions of this thus far? Then I'd like to read the timeline. I'm going to give Mr. Grasso then uh, time for an opening statement, and we'll go for brief statements from the witnesses and answer questions generally. So, but, but, but uh, I, I'm not intending to, to absolve anyone of any wrongdoing in the past as it relates to testing integrity. Uh, far from it. Uh, but what I want to do is to put in context you know, where we are in the district as opposed to some of the more uh, aggressive uh, efforts of testing that have been found in other jurisdictions. So I'd like to start uh, in August of 2008. When, and I'm just going to read this. And again, uh, Madam Chancellor, Mr. Inspector General, please uh, make notes of where there might be holes and, uh, and uh, to help us fill in our understanding of the timeline. So in August of 2008, uh, the D.C. Office of the State Superintendent of Education, or OSSI, requested an erasure analysis of the 2008 D.C. CAS results from, from McGraw-Hill. And McGraw-Hill was the entity that uh, provides us our testing materials, and they do analyses for us. Okay, so that was in August of 2008. In September of 2008, McGraw-Hill conducts the erasure analysis of the 2008 D.C. CAS results. In October, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Education Inspector General's report, OSSI tried to make initial contact with the DCPS by phone regarding the results of the McGraw-Hill analysis and to notify DCPS and OSSI that, that OSSI would be requesting the DCPS investigate the findings. 
there was no, and again, this is according to the Office of Inspector General uh, from the U.S. Department of Education, there was no response from the Chancellor's Office, and a second phone call also yielded no response. On November 21, 2008, Aussie Superintendent, or then Superintendent, Deborah Gist, sends a letter to Chancellor M Michelle Ree regarding the uh, the high rate of wrong-to-right erasures identified in the McGraw-Hill analysis. This letter provided a brief explanation of the methodology <coughs> used to flag the erasures, asked DCPS to investigate the results, and to report back to OSSI within 60 days. According to the USA Today, uh, then-Superintendent Gist's requests met resistance from then-Chancellor Ree staff. Then we forward to January 7, 2009, when Aaron McGoldrick, DCPS's data <coughs> and uh, accountability officer, sends a letter to OSSI asking for an extension in time in light of the volume of classrooms and schools with statistically, uh, with statistically problematic erasure rates, uh, or aberrant erasure rates. Um, three days later, on January 10, 2009, uh, Dr. Kimberly Statham, uh, Deputy State uh, Superintendent of Education at OSSI, grants DCPS a request for an extension to respond to the November 21, 2008 letter from OSSI requesting that DCPS investigate the DC CAS erasures. On January 28, 2009, a DCPS official who is unidentified gives Faye G. Sandy Sanford, other who will now be referred to as Sandy Sanford, of Edunearing, a copy of the November 21, 2008 letter from OSSI requesting the DCPS to investigate the high number of erasures of the, of the 2008 DC CAS. The DC official told him, quote, to read this and tell me what you think, end quote. On January 30th, Again, two days after that, Sandy Sanford sends a memo to an unidentified DCPS, to unidentified DCS officials. And this is the memo that was the subject of last week's uh, revelation or news reports. Uh, the memo outlined his analysis of the Aussie letter. It asked recipients to not leave the memo, quote, laying around, end quote, and warns of serious implications of the Aussie analysis. On February 28, 2009, Aaron, then Aaron uh, McGoldrick, DC, from DCPS, uh, requests from OSSI more details on the two lists of schools OSSI submits for possible investigation. She notes that the list was compiled using two different statistical methods for identifying examples of high right to wrong answers. Noise was on both lists. Elementary, uh, noise Elementary was on both lists. Further, she outlines the initial data analysis that DCPS had done as well as requests additional information on OSSI's data and methodologies, which she said would be required before DCPS could move forward with an in-depth investigation. On March 7, 2009, McGraw-Hill provides OSSI with a memo describing their erasure analysis methodology and advises against concluding that cheating behavior occurred in the flagged schools based solely on erasure flagging. Further, it states that the statistic that quote the statistical calculated the statistic calculated for each school and classroom does not appear to be consistent with any known approach to analyzing erasure patterns. As a result, the approach does not support evaluation of a hypothesis that cheating has occurred. Again, that is our our, te our testing uh, vendor. Uh, again, in March of 2009. OSSI issues and implements new test security guidelines for the then 2009 DC CAS, known as the District of Columbia uh, State Test Security Guidelines. These guidelines include instructions for districts to develop their own test security plans, requirements for teachers to acknowledge that they have received test security practices, and procedures for monitoring the administration of DC CAS. April 1, 2009, OSSI sends uh, DCPS an explanation of McGraw, or sends uh, DCPS an explanation of McGraw Hill's erasure analysis methodology. The correspondence states that, quote, the data from the analysis does not provide evidence or confirmation of inappropriate testing behaviors. 
Follow-up investigation is required before final conclusions can be drawn and appropriate action taken. On May 8, 2009, Aaron McGoldrick, again from DCPS, sends a memo entitled DCPS Testing Integrity Assurance Measures to Alex Harris, Assistant Superintendent for Assessment and Accountability at OSSI. The memo provided information to OSSI about the steps DCPS had taken to improve test security. Those steps included, one, examining erasure rates provided by OSSI, Two, conducted a literature review to understand erasure analysis and how it could be used to identify possible infractions. Three, provided training on <coughs> erasures and test security to DCPS principals. Four, created a DCPS test security plan, which was shared with OSSI. Five, created a daily security checklist for test coordinators to complete each day of testing. In the spring of 2009, according to Sandy Sanford, Ed Unearing, what he, uh, he was, quote, vaguely, end quote, remembered a DCPS official stopping the investigation of the 2008 erasures after it became clear it would conflict with the administration of the 2009 CAS. In September, September 3rd, 2009, the Office of the District of Columbia Deputy uh, Mayor for Education issues a memo uh, titled, quote, The Report on DC CAS Testing Security Protocols. This memo began by summarizing the significant gains DCPS schools had witnessed on the DC CAS in the past several years and stressed the importance of testing integrity in order to ensure the reliability of the measures of that progress. The memo states that the 2008 DC CAS erasures analysis conducted by OSSI was, quote, <coughs> ultimately inconclusive, end quote. It highlighted the new OSSI testing guidelines and efforts by DCPS and charters to improve testing integrity. In the fall of 2009, eight DCPS schools received team awards based on their 2009 DCCAS gains. The team awards were limited to DCPS schools that achieved dramatic student achievement gains, along with other benchmarks, and documented how those gains and benchmarks were achieved. Funding for the team awards was provided by the U.S. Department of Education's Teacher Incentive Fund, DCPS, and private donors. On September 15, 2009, Noise Education Campus received a Blue Ribbon certification from the U.S. Department of Education. This award was based partly on performance on standardized tests. On December 17, 2009, DCPS signed contracts with Caveat to review security protocols at each of the eight schools flagged for unusual rates of answer sheet erasures on the 2009 DC CAS. Cavion was also interviewed, has al was also to interview a quote sample of teachers who administered the suspect tests. On February 23rd, 24th, 2010, Cavion concludes that investigation into eight schools regarding the 2009 CAS, BC CAS. Cavion did not find evidence of cheating at any of the schools. However, they did suggest stricter testing protocols. In March of 2010, DCPS sends a copy of the Cavion report to OSSI. On March 16, 2010, Kathy Carruthers, the Assistant Superintendent, Division of Elementary and Secondary Education at OSSI, sends a letter to then-Chancellor Rhee acknowledging receipt and review of the Cavion investigation findings. OSSI concluded that seven of the eight schools investigated showed no evidence of test security violations. However, while it did not find that there, while it did find that there was no evidence of test security violations at Stanton, it determined that a certain teacher may not participate in the administration of the 2010 DC CAS, and that DCPS must conduct a review of the, D, of the 2010 DC CAS and submit a report to OSSI no later than June 15, 2010. OSSI also f found evidence that a Burville Elementary School teacher engaged in a testing security violation by, quote, cleaning up stray marks from student answer sheets, end quote. As a result of this violation, OSSI invalidated that teacher's math and reading CAS scores. The letter also informed DCPS of their right to appeal these decisions. On October 26, 2010, USA Today reporter Jack Gillum asked to visit Noyes and Stanton. His request was denied. The 
uh, Sophia Jafari Simmons, the Assistant Press Secretary of DCPS at the time, informs Principal Cathorn that the request has been made and denied. On February 11, 2011, DCPS signs a contract with Cavion once again to scrutinize 10 schools flagged for security issues on the 2010 DCCAS. The list of deliverables is largely the same as the 2009 contract. On March 20, 2011, Chancellor Henderson is notified by Linda Matthews of USA Today that the cover story on the erasures will run on Wednesday, 23, 2011. On March 21, 2011, Chancellor Henderson issues a statement saying that DCPS adheres to stringent training and test administration guidelines. The statement goes on to say that once DCPS was notified of the erasure rates, Cavion was brought on as an expert investigator. <coughs> From that investigation, the Chancellor stated that the procedures had been tightened and approved. On March 28, 2011, Cavion issues a, quote, clarification statement on the 2009 DCCAS investigation, explaining that the scope of the investigation, explaining the scope uh, of its investigation and its findings. The statement explained the methodology of their investigation, including that they interviewed, uh, including who they interviewed and the potential reasons outside of cheating for high erasure rates. On March 29, 2011, Chancellor Henderson requests that the D.C. Office of the Inspector General investigate allegations of, D of cheating based on the D.C. CAS in part and on the USA Today article entitled, quote, when standardized tests score in D.C. were the gains real, end quote. On May 2, 2011, former Noyes principal Adele Cawthorn files a false, federal false claim suit against DCPS. It is kept under seal until a partial lift was granted on May, uh, in May of 2012. The suit was fully unsealed on December 26, 2012. On July 28, 2011, the U.S. Department of Education Inspector General and the Assistant U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia interviewed then-Principal Cawthorn uh, and concluded she did not have direct knowledge of improprieties related to D.C. CAS. The U.S. Attorney Criminal Division chooses not to assign a criminal attorney. In, February, in fall of 2011 through the spring of 2012, the D.C. Office of the Inspector General along with the U.S. Department of Education Office of its Inspector General continued their investigation interviewing 48 individuals. On March 8, 2012, OSSI selects Alvarez and Marcel to independently investigate the validity of the 2011 D.C. CAS. On June 21, 2012, Alvarez and Marcel uh, issue a statement in which they find few violations of fraud and certainly nothing systemic. On August 8, 2012, the D.C. Office of the Inspector General issues its report finding insufficient evidence to conclude that there was widespread cheating on the D.C. CAS during the years in question. On S September of 2012, the U.S. Attorney's Office, their civil division, uh, determines there is insufficient basis on which to intervene on the Cawthorn complaint. So both the criminal and then the civil division of the U.S. Attorney uh, declines. And in December 26, 2012, uh, Cawthorn's lawsuit is unsealed and reported to the media. So this is the timeline that takes us up to last week in which we have um, the discussion of the most recent 2012 D.C. CAS scores, which we are still reviewing. Um, this is the timeline that the committee has assembled and is working from and from which we will ask certain questions today with an emphasis on the January 30th, 2009 memo. Um, I would ask both uh, individuals to be prepared to respond to whether or not there are any holes. In the meantime, I would like to turn to my colleague, Mr. Grasso, uh, for an opening statement and to thank him for his indulgence why I tried to uh, at least place the, uh, the chronology as I understand it before um, before the committee. Mr. Grosser. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Chairman Catania, and I, I appreciate you reading the timeline to the record um, and look forward to hearing the, the back and forth on, on really where it stands and, and where we are. I, I, as I mentioned to you before the hearing, I don't have a, a huge um, desire to dig into the past. I, I have, I've said since the beginning of my campaign and the beginning of my time on the council, I'm looking forward and want to see how we can uh, move education 
perform forward and try to uh, avoid these mistakes as we move along. So um, with that, I'd like to read a statement into the record as well. Um, and this probably applies for this hearing as well as the hearing following this on your bill uh, around testing integrity and consequences for cheating. Um, so I appreciate you convening this roundtable on testing integrity in district schools, and I appreciate all of our witnesses being here for this important conversation. <laughs> Although only a small percentage, I was disappointed to learn that 16 of our schools had test security violations for the most recent CAS. And not only does it exasperate a, a cloud of distrust among our education professionals and the public by subverting the accountability process, but we've also robbed these students, some of whom are struggling, of a true appraisal of their progress over the past academic year. While reviewing the 2009 memo and the most recent investigation report, I could not help but wonder how did we get here? How have we managed to create a climate in which increasing numbers of educators feel they have no choice but to cross ethical lines? For a long time, testing was used mainly to provide teachers and parents with a tool to measure how a student is progressing academically. And then along the way, with the introduction of No Child Left Behind and Impact, we began to believe that by linking educators' salaries to student test scores, schools can then be held accountable for student performance. As we have seen both here and in other jurisdictions, the heavy reliance on testing results cannot alone make reform a success. Administrators, teachers, heads of schools, and central office employees should all be held accountable for failing to reach specific milestones in a broader school reform effort. Ultimately, the entire DC government must take on the responsibility to do all it can to create a healthy and thriving city so that our education professionals only have to focus on academic successes. I'm not convinced that we have done all we can, but I'm also not convinced our school reform leaders have done all they can. It has been six years since the implementation of mayoral control over our schools, and there is still not a citywide plan for education. Six years into this reform process, and we still have embarrassingly low proficiency numbers in reading and math. Six years into this reform process, and what amazes me is that we still don't have a simple, unified public measure for parents to understand how an individual school is performing. Six years into this process, and it's hard for parents to plan for their child's education because our policies and the landscape of offerings change every year. This cheating issue is but a small symptom of a larger problem. Any cheating is a reflection on leadership, the mayor, the council, and the heads of each LEA. The time has come to question whether the plan has failed. Has mayor control succeeded? Has no child left behind succeeded? Has Teach for America made a difference in DC? I do not see the evidence and see no plan to move us forward. We have reached a crisis stage in our education reform and we must begin to question the leadership. This may appear to be a harsh assessment, but I have to ask, who is guiding our education reform? Why does it seem there are no guiding principles and no plan? Once you get to the accountability issue, you inevitably have to ask, what is the role of the council in guiding education reform? In fact, what is the role of the entire government to ensure there is a space for a quality education system to emerge or even exist? There are many standout shining examples of success in our school system. In fact, there have always been these examples. Students have always succeeded in the harshest climates. Teachers and principals have willed schools from chaos to success and school clusters have been turned around by strong-willed, organized parents. This has generally been in spite of, not because of what we have done as a government, whether your issue is health, public safety, affordable housing, or jobs, economic development, education reform must factor into every decision you make. I do not believe that DC has ever focused the entirety of its resources on improving education. Placing the education system directly under the mayor allowed us to hold one person accountable the mayor. However, every elected official must place education reform not only at the center of her platform, but at the center of her work and on the council or as the mayor. There must be a way to push for and demand accountability without creating a climate of such perverse incentives, leaving our students without the critical thinking and analytical skills they need to become engaged, productive members of society. The entire government must be committed to that goal and I look forward to listening to today's testimony to better understand how we're going to get there. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Cross. So we've been joined uh, by uh, 
Councilmember McDuffie, who is not a member of the committee, but nonetheless uh, very interested in the subject. Uh, Mr. McDuffie, would you like to make an opening statement? Very briefly, uh, Chairman Catania. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. McDuffie, Councilmember for Ward 5, and I want to thank Councilmember Catania uh, for convening these very important, uh, this hearing on the recently report, released uh, report of OSI and the Testing Integrity Act of 2013, which was co-introduced, uh, introduced by Council Members Catania, Che, Barry, and which I co-sponsored. Uh, as I most know, I, uh, though I'm not a member of the Education Committee, the issue of education is near and dear to me, not only as a parent and a child and graduate of DCPS, uh, but as many in this city, uh, a concerned citizen who wants to see that our students are receiving the top tier education that any child in the nation's capital uh, should be receiving. Uh, as of the latest round of testing, in the National Assessment of, for Educational Progress, 41% of our fourth graders were below the basic level of math, 56% of our students were below the basic level of reading. Logically, the problem continues as the students matriculate to eighth grade, where 58% of our students are below basic in math and 54% are below basic in reading. Uh, we use our own DC CAS testing to evaluate students and schools' progress yearly. It's vital that we get a clear picture of a student's achievement level so that administrators and teachers can allocate time and resources to those classrooms that are most in need. And asking questions about testing integrity and in co-sponsoring this legislation, my intention is not to vilify teachers or principals or administrators. My concern revolves solely around the children who are the real victims in the situation. Every time scores are manipulated upwards, we're leaving behind students who deserve and to whom we owe additional services but who will not receive those additional services because artificially inflated test scores sometimes cause them not to be identified. Had these issues ever been thoroughly investigated, we might not be sitting here today looking at another report from OSSI indicating that several schools have issues with their scores. The thought that Logan, which is located in Ward 5, whose scores are already lagging, uh, have been inflated uh, is frightening to me. We are failing our children in supreme fashion, and if those scores have come only after being inflated. Rather than being defensive about this topic and process, we should all be inviting the full examination of the procedures and safeguards around testing integrity. If the problem is not widespread, then an in-depth examination will confirm that. If the problem is widespread, then no one involved in the manipulation of scores should be removed before they do more harm to our children's futures. I'm also at the point where I think that we need to discuss the concept of student testing scores being heavily tied to teacher evaluations. I will reserve judgment on whether the change needs to be made, but I think the issue uh, needs to be discussed. I'll close my remarks uh, with again thanking you, uh, Councilmember Katani, for holding this hearing and for your work thus far to really address what has been a sore spot for our city for decades. As we both on the Government Operations Committee, I also look forward to working with you to ensure that future investigations into testing and any other issue regarding our schools is thorough, accurate, and reliable. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. McDuffie, and I appreciate uh, your interest in this as well as uh, that of Mr. Grasso. Uh, just to set the table slightly, because I think in this context of, of uh, testing scandals that are swirling around uh, the country, there's a tendency to want to believe that they are all the same. Uh, there are differences uh, in, in at least what has been reported publish, published uh, publicly. Uh, with respect to Atlanta, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 178 individuals that were identified as culprits, 82 of, of whom actually confessed to the cheating as part of this investigation. Uh, you know, I understand anecdotally that the situation in Atlanta was very different because there was much more openness, or there was in fact openness about some of the improper activities. You know, I've heard reports. Uh, of uh, whether it's Philadelphia or of Atlanta, of actually house parties where teachers would get together and change test scores. Uh, there's no evidence at this point of that. And, and I'm of two minds. Number one, I share my colleagues' concerns that our current policies and procedures are a work in progress and do not ensure integrity. And that's why I authored the Testing Integrity Act to memorialize some of the strong policies that OSSI has put in place in recent years, but to go further and to model it after. Uh, a, a very important piece of legislation in Alabama that has tackled this issue. Uh, what the difference again between perhaps at, at Georgia and here 
in Georgia, the governor asked the Georgia um, Bureau of Investigation to conduct this analysis. For those who want the council to be essentially the District of Columbia's Bureau of Investigation, that is a tall order for a, a very small staff. Similarly, uh, the individuals in Georgia were prosecuted under the under a local RICO statute, a Georgia state statute on racketeering. And I'm uh, informed that the district does not have a similar statute for purposes, even if we were to retry this. Uh, further, the purpose of my act is to once and for all actually embed in district law that, that violations of test integrity will be treated as a crime. Today in the District of Columbia, there are no laws nor municipal regulations that prohibit the kinds of activities that we are talking about today, nor that punish it. What we have are recently enacted guidelines from ASI that do not carry the weight of law. I'm not trying to suggest again that what happened in the past is acceptable or foolproof. Uh, I do, in, in, in fact, when I look at our Inspector General's investigation and find no conclusive evidence of widespread cheating, I have to give that weight. When the Inspector General for the U.S. Department of, Investi uh, US Department of Education investigates and finds no evidence of widespread cheating or knowledge on the part of our senior officials, I have to give that weight. When we have hired outside consultants twice from Cavion and they find no evidence, Cavion, by the way, is the entity that helped uncover what is going on in Atlanta, they review us not once but twice <laughs> and find no evidence. When our testing uh, vendor, McGraw-Hill, finds no evidence, when Alvarez and Marcel, hired by Asi, not DCPS, finds no evidence. And finally, when the U.S. Attorney's Civil Division and Criminal Division, following an investigation, decide there is not enough evidence to pursue, I have these various weights. And on the other hand, I have you know, concerns about a system that is not foolproof. Uh, and I have a lack of confidence in the system, which has really led us here today. Today will not be, it is not intended to be an exhaustive uh, review of the subject. Uh, it's intended to have certain questions answered and, and then a decision made as to how we proceed. I believe it's more constructive for this committee's limited time and energy to ingrain in law and enshrine in law that this is not only improper but illegal and to set about um, uh, a procedure to ensure integrity going forward. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask that, that my two witnesses uh, please stand because I'm going to ask that you uh, take an oath before the committee. Uh, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under a penalty of perjury? I do. Okay, please have, have your seat. Take your seat. Um, Chancellor, I'm going to ask for you to begin. I know you have a flight, uh, and so uh, in, out of an in the interest of your uh, schedule, I'm going to ask of you to begin, and then, Mr. Willoughby, I'm going to have uh, you provide your, your uh, brief written testimony. Okay? okay? Chancellor, please. Good morning, Councilmember Catania, uh, members of the committee, and uh, Councilmember McNuffie. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify regarding DCPS's implementation of the DC CAS test and the work that we do to ensure that our results are fair and accurate. I've submitted a longer statement for the record, but in the interest of time, rather than read that testimony, I want to make four clear points. First, DCPS takes testing integrity very seriously. We investigate every allegation of wrongdoing and take personnel action whenever it is warranted. We simply do not tolerate cheating. Each of the six investigations have occurred that have occurred in the past four years have come to the same conclusion, that there is no, wide, no evidence of widespread cheating at DCPS. When individual cases of wrongdoing occur, we take decisive action. Second, we've received the results of the 2012 investigation managed by the OSSI and conducted by Alvarez and Marcel. We're grateful to the OSSI for the time and energy they put into this investigation. Based on these findings, we've removed every individual who is implicated in, in impropriety from their testing responsibilities for the 2013 DC CAS text test next week. Going forward, we will ensure that we have sufficient information and will take the appropriate personnel action for each employee. 
third, we've made significant improvements in our DC CAS administration over the years and for this year. In addition to the many procedures that we've already had in place, we've added two protocols to further discourage cheating. This year, we're ensuring that teachers do not administer the CAS test to their own students. By rotating staff, we'll remove the temptation to assist students in their exams. Second, we've added additional safety seals to be used on the containers used for testing items. These seals, in addition to the seals on individual testing booklets and the requirements that the materials be kept in a locked room, will ensure that no one has inappropriate access to testing materials. Finally, we are continuously looking for ways in which we can improve our test administration. As you mentioned, um, with No Child Left Behind, we were ushered into an era where, <coughs> in fact, we had mandates that we did not know how to meet, um, nor were we financed to meet. And so, um, to this end, we support the Council's proposal to codify testing requirements and to implement clear consequences for impropriety. Good morning, Chairperson. Uh, before, before you begin, I'm sorry. Uh, Chancellor, I'm sorry, I was just doing some housekeeping with my colleague. I, were there any corrections that you would want to put on the record uh, uh, to help complete uh, our understanding of the timeline? I, I think your understanding of the timeline is consistent with mine. Um, I was trying to keep up. I didn't, if there was something slightly different, I didn't see any major right. issues with the timeline. Thank you. Um, Mr. Willoughby. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Catania and members of the committee, and also on Ch um, Council Member McDuffie. I am Charles J. Willoughby, Inspector General, and I am pleased to appear before you today to provide testimony at the public roundtable concerning testing integrity for the District of Columbia Public Schools. Based on our joint investigation with the United States Department of Education Office of the Inspector General, also referred to as EDOIG, concerning cheating on the DC Comprehensive DC, uh, Assessment System, DC or CAS uh, standardized examination administered by DCPS, the reports of which are on our website and EDOIG's website. While we did not find evidence of widespread cheating, the D.C. Office of the Inspector General did find evidence of lax and or deficient security with respect to maintaining the integrity of the testing process and test results. Our investigation resulted in the following. The investigation revealed a number of problems with overall exam security, which may have compromised the integrity of D.C. CAS exams administered at Noyes Education Campus. The information obtained from the interviews conducted shows that there were security flaws at noise in the administration of the DC CAS exams for at least three school years, 2008 to 2009, 2010 to, I'm sorry, 2009 to 2010, and 2010 to 2011. Many of the security issues noted may be applicable to other schools as well. The investigation revealed that the official exam booklets were delivered to noise prior to the first day of the exam and stored in a locked office to which at least three people had the key. Having the exam booklets on site prior to the first day of the exam allows for many opportunities for the exam to be compromised or an exam booklet to be stolen or copied. Storing them in an office to which at least three people had the key allows for opportunities for theft review or copying. With respect to the answer sheets, investigators were told that students started on the first day of the exam with an answer sheet containing a pre-printed barcoded label, which they turned in at the completion of the exam on each day. The next day, the students received the same answer sheet containing their answers from all of the previous days and were expected to add the answers from that day's section of the exam to the same answer sheet. This allows students opportunities to change their answers on sections of the exam administered in previous days. Also, as noted above, the answer sheets were stored each day in a locked office to which at least three people had the key with no additional security. This practice affords opportunities for the answer sheets to be lost, stolen, misfiled, or tampered with, such as having answers erased and changed. With respect to allegations that noise personnel erased and changed student answers on their answer sheets, investigators found no evidence to corroborate these allegations. In addition, investigators were unable to conclusively to determine whether official exam booklets had been distributed as described. The investigation, however, revealed some anecdotal evidence that the official exam booklets, which were on site prior to the beginning of the exam, had been distributed to teachers for use in creating practice questions and are providing instructions 
to the students in preparation for the actual exam, which raises another security concern. Why should teachers have access to official exam booklets prior to the official start of the exam? The investigation also revealed one specific instance where it appears that a teacher assisted students with identifying wrong answers during the exam. After completing the review of DC CAS exams administered at NOISE, the OIG assessed whether expanding the scope of the investigation to other schools was warranted, noting that once it became known that DCPS requested an investigation into allegations about test erasures, it is logical to conclude that any improper practices that may have occurred in the past would diminish. Based on this assessment, which also included weighing factors such as the existence of specific allegations and the nature of the allegations, the facts uncovered during the investigation related to noise and the results of Cavion's investigation, the OIG found an insufficient basis to warrant expanding the scope of the investigation to other DCPS schools. Specifically, the OIG noted the disparity in the unusually high number of erasures. The mere disparity, as noted and or inferred from the Cavion report, without more, such as specific evidence of impropriety, was not a sufficient basis to conclude that the erasures resulted from cheating. A review of Cavion's report of investigation revealed no corroborated evidence of cheating or indicators of widespread cheating to provide investigative leads for OIG investigators to pursue. Several of those interviewed during the investigation had worked at other schools either before or after working at NOISE. None of those interviewed informed investigators of cheating at any of those other schools. And although the OIG investigation as to NOISE revealed areas where test security should be improved, it did not reveal any evidence of widespread cheating or indicators of widespread cheating. The lack of security employed at NOISE during the administration of a DC CAS exams, as exhibited by each of these specific details noted above, contributed to creating an atmosphere where cheating on the exam and or other actions that could compromise exam integrity could have occurred. While the investigation did not reveal evidence of criminal activity or widespread cheating on the DC CAS exams, the investigation did reveal deficiencies and problem areas warranting recommendations to DCPS for action. Based on the investigation, the OIG recommends that DCPS review the factual findings of this investigation, determine their applicability to all DCPS schools, and implement sufficient procedures as needed to ensure the integrity of DC CAS exams administered to its students. Such security and non-security related procedures should include take delivery of the official exam booklets on the day that the, that section of the exam is to be administered to mitigate the opportunities for cheating, provide additional on-site security to ensure that the exam booklets are secured with limited access until they are distributed to the classrooms and distributed properly. Transport the official exam booklets used each day and the student answer sheets used each day to a secure off-site location to mitigate opportunities for alteration. If having the official exam booklets delivered to the test sites each day of the exam is not possible, then the official exam booklets must be stored in a secure location to which only select personnel have access and provide additional security to guard the exams overnight. Take all steps possible to ensure that the official exam is not distributed in advance of the exam administration and not used for improper purposes such as the creation of practice questions. Have students start each test day with a blank answer sheet which will not contain the answers to questions administered on that test day. Consider having all exams and answer sheets placed into sealed boxes by classroom at the conclusion of each testing day. All seals should be examined when the boxes are distributed to the classrooms the next day to ensure that no tampering or opening took place overnight. Have a monitor on site each day to count all test booklets and ensure that each test booklet is sealed before it is distributed for the administration of the exam. That monitor also should count and verify that all test booklets and answer sheets are turned in at the completion of each exam day. This monitor should be someone who is not an employee of that particular school. 
increase the number of proctors so that there are at least two people in addition to the teacher present in the classroom during the administration of the exam. Rotate the teachers and proctors so that teachers and proctors do not administer the exam to their own students and so that the teachers and proctors are not in the same classroom each day of the exam. Increase the number of monitors so that the monitors can regularly view the classrooms during the exam and ensure that the monitors can view all parts of the classroom. Provide more specific instructions to the monitors as to what they are supposed to look for and how and when they are supposed to report anomalies and or irregularities. Establish a written policy clarifying where the monitors should enter classroom during testing. Provide teachers, proctors, and monitors with, form, with the form on which they are required to report any anomalies that occur during the administration of the exam. Train all appropriate personnel on the use of such forms. Assign appropriate personnel to review all such forms at the conclusion of the administration of the DC CAS exams each day. Conduct training regarding exam security for all teachers, proctors, monitors, and other school personnel to ensure that all staff members understand the need to protect exam integrity at all times and conduct appropriate training to remind all personnel of their obligations to report matters of waste, fraud, and abuse to the Office of the Inspector General. This concludes my testimony. I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Inspector General, before I turn to my colleagues, it's practice of the committee that I turn to members and ask questions as the final member. Uh, are there any corrections you'd like to make in your understanding of the timeline as I read it? No, I think it was pretty thorough, um, um, Chairperson, but I, do, I would just add that the Department of Education report was issued in, I believe it's January 13th of, of this year. Okay. And that, that, that report is currently on the website, as I indicated in my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Willoughby. Uh, Mr. Grasso, uh, we will have uh, 10 minute rounds. Uh, thank you again for coming. Appreciate it, um, as always. Um, you know, uh, that was a pretty exhaustive list you just read, Inspector. And I, I'm just wondering, have you, you've shared that, of course, and given the recommendation to the Chancellor and made sure that she's aware of all these recommendations? Yes, we've issued the report. So they got the report and they know that these are, and did, when did you last, like, when was that done? Uh, maybe I missed that. That would have been done in August of 2012, and, and, and um, we should be. Um, we normally what we do is, and I can't off the top of my head. Normally, what we do is require a follow-up until we have a, 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 an internal tickler system. Where if we don't hear anything back, have you heard anything back? Off the top of my head, I can't recall at this very moment. Okay. I think we have. Yes, we have. I understand we have. Yes. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a fairly exhaustive list of recommendations. It sounds like it might cost a little money, but it, it does seem like it's a, an appropriate approach. However, um, Chancellor Henderson, I wonder if you might take a minute to um, walk us through the evolution of testing in D.C., really, uh, from a very basic perspective. Let people know where did we start, because, um, you know, in any good judge of how things are progressing, we can look and see whether or not change has been made. And you listed some changes today that I think are helpful for next year, or for this year actually, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then I kind of want to see how that moves into the following year. So um, in light of the rotating staff this year and things like that, what did you, what, did, what had happened from 08 to today? Yeah. Um, so from in 08, I think, um, again, we were not in an environment where um, testing integrity was this, I think, um, specific. We didn't get um, the kind of specific guidance from the OSI that we are now getting. But you would we say the test integrity is always has always been a priority for DCPS. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, in 2008, when we received this information from the OSI um, around flagging classrooms, we received two different sets of information. As, and as Councilmember Catania shared, we had questions. In fact, the Sandy Sanford memo um, says, don't spread this around because basically this is all based on incomplete information. And I think DCPS, the DCPS officials at the time did what they could to ascertain um, the correct information, but we could not launch an investigation 
investigation of 171 classrooms or whatever the number was, um, and so tried to work with the OSSI to figure out what the deal was. Um, after the CTB McGraw-Hill uh, memo um, and then direction, my understanding is verbal direction from the OSSI to Aaron McGoldrick, our former chief of data and accountability, we were instructed not to investigate the 2008 erasures because they were inconclusive because they had this these right. discrepancies. So, so, and so what, what did you do in 2009 to make sure what happened in 2000 yeah. or even I know you're not going to say what happened or didn't happen, but what, well, yeah, sure. what did you do in 2009? So what sure we did after was that was problem. we added external res, uh, observers, so non-school-based employees. Central office employees were deployed to schools to monitor testing. Um, we added uh, folks from cluster offices as well um, to track schools' progress around testing. We issued guidance on assessments for the first time, um, and we required schools to submit test plans. We followed that with an investigation from Cavion on the back end, so we put protocols in place in front and then behind. After the Cavion investigation, they gave us recommendations, um, and the following year, uh, we had post-test visits so with this observers. Is in uh, yep. Okay. Uh, Post-cast post visits where observers or witnesses watched the test packing because we it was assumed that um, the tampering if if it occurred would happen and you know mm -hmm. before tests were packed up, um, we required specific information about makeup tests. So if kids don't show up on a day at a test, they have the opportunity to make things up and we weren't collecting that right. data uh, previously. Um, we shifted the ship the. Uh, shipping. So we previously tests were at the school for long amounts of time and we closed the shipping window um, and we put security seals on booklets. The following year... So 2011? Uh, yes. Um, we required, again, based on, and, and after every investigation, we got recommendations on how to increase our test security. So um, the following year, we issued the two-person rule um, where Preparation and packing of material had to be done by two people at all times. Um, no one person could be with the testing material. We required immediate packing okay. of the materials. I, I think I get a flavor of what, what was going on. Can you tell me in any particular case, 09, 10, 11, 12, that you did something that was proactive, that wasn't reactionary to a report or study or to something that happened? Tell me an example of something where you actually sat down in your offices and said, okay, this is what we have to anticipate and move forward from here. Um, I, and I think, you know, perhaps this year is the first example I can see of it where you're doing these rotating uh, teacher assignments and stuff, but can you point to one where it wasn't just a reaction to something that happened in the past? So again, you know, not we didn't have any guidance on how we did test integrity like every other school district in the country and so at the end of every testing period we'd look back and figure out what we could do so we set up hotlines and in fact what we did was we looked around the country to see what other school districts were doing we set up hotlines and asked people to report we did trainings um, we actually had people sign a test affidavit um, and we did all of those things without investigations telling us but in fact the reason that we hired Cavion is because um, we never we thought that we needed an objective third party to actually do the investigation and to make recommendations to us and that and in that Cavion was at the time the best and the only test security company we thought that we were going above and right. beyond by securing the professionals to help us implement this I'm you know I, I hear what you're saying I, I'm, I'm just looking for a way to uh, to kind of say hey we're doing some planning here so what about next year. So uh, I'm okay with your immediate response to last year's for this year right now, but what's going to happen next year? You know, next year I believe we have common core assessments coming into place, and from what I understand, they're going to be done um, mostly computer-based. Is that not the case? In 2015, the park, which is a computer-assessed assessment, will be online. We can't anticipate right now what the test security issues are going to be because we haven't gotten an understanding of what, what the test the, is going to look like. But it will be computer-based. Um, yes. Is that correct? So all these which things around sealing and observing, all that's going to go out no the longer, That's so, right. 
So I guess what I'm hoping to hear from you is that we have a team in place of X number of people who are thinking about this and taking test integrity seriously today about what the future looks like, not, again, in reaction to what's happening in the past. Well, so we do, but... Wait, 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 wait a minute. So, so that you can at least, in this situation, make everyone in the city feel like there's something being done to really, you know, hold when you're holding people accountable with these test scores. What, you know... You know, when you, when you're doing this, how do you get to the point where people can say, "Okay, you have the credibility that it's being done right." If you don't stop and plan today for what's coming down the road in a year or two years or five years. So I, I want to. I, I don't want to leave the impression that we don't plan. After every test administration, we go back impression. and we look. I'm sorry, but after every test in, uh, uh, administration, we go back, we look, we hear the reports that we get from our hotlines and teachers, and in fact, we have called for the investigations, all but I think two of them, um, to help us ensure that test integrity 2015? is right. Are we going to be in 2016 and you're going to Council come Member back Council Member I can't tell you what the test well, security measures are going to be. Can, can I answer the question on a test that we've never seen before? We don't know if the children are all going to sit in one room. We don't know if they're going to go out and three will be on a computer at a time. We don't know. So we're working very closely. And in fact, since all of this test integrity stuff has happened, the designers of the park are taking much of this into account, and that my my suspect, my suspicion is that we'll get clear guidance. I need, I well, guess, well, well, to understand. Well, I, 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 I do too, but I need you to understand this. The ASI administers the test. The ASI provides test guidance. We are doing what we are supposed to do, and in fact, more by calling for the Inspector General, by paying, in fact, for the investigation. And only this past year did ASI actually take on the responsibility to investigate the exam that it administers. So DCPS has been diligent. So so is it so in, your stance in ensuring that testing integrity is right? So is is it your stance that testing integrity is something new to this world? I mean, this is what bothers me is that no. you know whether or not we are in, have integrity in how we take tests and you know score tests is not something new. We've been doing this for years and years and years and years. So to come to me and say that we can't create a plan for something to come along because it's new is not a good answer. That's not what I said, Council Member Grasso. You keep saying testing integrity is new. That is not what I said. I have not said that at all. That's not what I said so at all. say it again then. What, what I said you to you is, you asked me, am I going to have a plan right now for the park, a test that we don't know how will be administered. All we know is that it will be on a computer. But and the so, principles of integrity, the principles of not cheating. The principles of integrity. Who we are as human beings. But the principles of integrity. To study that. the study That's not what I told you. I just told you that I don't have a test security plan for the park. The principles of integrity are all through the timeline that Councilmember Katina actually laid out. We are the people who have monitors in our classroom. We are the people who have paid for and called for investigations. Mm -hmm. We are the people who have made recommendations. All I'm saying. In fact. All so I'm integrity, saying. I, I and in the we, in sure, the we are, not and we will continue to be. To be. We just laid out for you. We just laid out for you all the things that we've done. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grasso. <coughs> um, before I turn, before I turn to uh, Mr. McDuffie, I, I want to say that you know we are charged with, uh, with with fixing this. Most importantly, from my opinion, going forward. Mm -hmm. I believe Mr. Grasso's questions are, you know, appropriately focused on how we do that. I understand mm -hmm. the structural problems, Chancellor, you may have in trying to anticipate integrity around a test you haven't seen, but I believe it's very constructive to focus on, on how we fix this going forward. Um, you know, there's no question in this country there is blood in the water mm -hmm. on the issue of testing integrity. It also significantly tracks you know, urban districts in particular, uh -huh. where so much of the emphasis has been because of our historical achievement gaps, uh -huh. where we are trying to and we want to have a quick solution, that if we simply, you know, can, can force this round peg into a square hole, you know, that we can produce things which should take uh, longer by virtue of the complexity of sure. the investment. You know, personally, I think that we are... We, you know, and I have, I have reviewed every one of these investigations. These, these binders are a fraction of what I have reviewed. If I found or felt that there was uh, institutional directed cheating, I would be in a very different point of view. I like you personally, Chancellor. Thank you. But that has nothing That's to right. do it shouldn't. with my job. If I found any evidence that suggested that, that there was a, a cover-up or significant uh, cheating, this would be a different 
situation. So I want to focus again on the legislation. I'm going to turn to Mr. McDuffie. Uh, and we, will, we, will, we, we were supposed to schedule or start our hearing on my bill at 10. It will probably be closer to 11. But I also think it's fair to say that while I have not seen widespread institutional evidence of cheating, I have seen, uh, as, as has been found in every single report, instances of possibilities sure. of lacks policies, procedures, holes in the system. Mm -hmm. So I think at the end of the day, we, have, we may have been more lucky than good in mm -hmm. terms of keeping this from being in sure. Atlanta. Agreed. All right? But also, you know, Chancellor, again, under, yeah. you know, we have different responsibilities in this conversation. I also want to be clear that we don't overstate what we have done thus far. I think mm -hmm. there have been good faith efforts. But according to, as recently as the, the, the uh, Marcellus and, uh, Alvarez and Marcellus report from last June, it uh, continues to highlight holes that we have to fill. Mm -hmm. And so going forward, I need to know who will be responsible, not just within your LEA, but each of the charter LEAs, mm -hmm. for knowing and understanding these holes. And I look for OSSI for guidance to advise, and that will be the subject of our discussions sooner rather than later today. Um, but, but many of our procedures we put in place are not necessarily working. The requirement that teachers sign an affidavit or testing integrity individuals sign affidavits is not occurring, for instance. The universality of the training, I'm not convinced is there. Mm -hmm. I think it's uneven at best. And so, you know, in our next hearing, we are going to talk about fixing this going forward. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry for that editorial interruption, okay. Mr. McDuffie. Let me uh, turn to you for your round of questions. Thank you, Chairman Catanian. And thank you uh, each for your testimony. I want to begin uh, my questions with uh, a couple of questions for you, Chancellor Henderson. Uh, you know, as we sit here and we, we, we listen to your testimony and, and we think about all the things that are important to this hearing in the process, uh, chief among them are testing integrity, which we talked a lot about, uh, as well as making sure that the security uh, protocols are in place uh, so that we can uh, avoid this happening in the future. Uh, but one of the things that concerns me that you know, we haven't talked as much about and I'd like to, to get your insights on is what actually happens when we find out that there is cheating and we have to invalidate test scores? What happens to the eighth graders who are rising, ninth graders in high school who uh, want to go to application schools that I imagine is part of the application process actually looks at their, their, their test scores? What, what happens to those students? Those students, the test scores are not, don't actually have consequences for students. So those eighth graders wouldn't be penalized going into the ninth grade and applying for an application school. What happens is that we don't have the information to understand where those young people are short so that the ninth grade teachers actually can plan for them. Well, that, that was my next point, yeah. uh, is that, you know, and I mentioned this briefly in my opening, is that you know, some of these students are going to be uh, sort of lost in this effort to, to boost test scores, whatever the motivation of the adults who, who are involved, um, because we don't have an accurate gauge of how they're faring, uh, at least as it, uh, uh, with regard to the, the DC CAS scores. No. But one of the things that we do, again, the CAS is one of multiple measures that we use. Um, most of our high schools going into the ninth grade will look at, uh, will do different assessments, uh, Gates-McGinty assessment or whatever, to understand where those ninth graders are so that we can try to address their needs. So it is, we do lose some information, but we have some other opportunities. Not perfect. I'd rather have all of the information. And I also want to ask, Ms. Councilman Regasso mentioned the recommendations that you had you had listed in your opening statement, uh, Mr. Willoughby, and Chancellor Henderson, I believe you talked about some of the things that you all did to address some of the initial allegations in 2008. Did you all implement any of the recommendations that were made by the IG's yeah. office following their report? I was actually just looking through them um, as he was reading, and, the, and um, the vast majority of them we actually have. The one that I, real, that I noticed that we have not done um, is have a different answer sheet for each child every day, um, and that the, uh, that's a test administration issue, so the OSSI would have to work with the test um, testing companies to change the answer sheet situation. We don't have control over that. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Williams, as you know, I've, I've been sort of critical of, of the investigation that the, uh, your office performed uh, because I have questions about how heavily you all relied on the uh, 
investigations of other entities, uh, because I think the Inspector General's office is, is charged with uh, making and conducting thorough investigations so that we can rely uh, on what you all conclude. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, it seems to me that you all relied heavily on the Cavion uh, investigation, and I don't know if you want to dispute that, but it seems you know, even in your report and even in your, your statements, you mentioned uh, several times that, uh, you know, the, the facts uncovered during the investigation related to noise and the results of Cavion's investigation. You went on to say after that, uh, the mere disparity as noted and or inferred from the Cavion report. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I hear sort of this, this theme that under, underscores your investigation about the Cavion report. And even part of your investigation, you talk about how you, you talked to Chancellor Henderson and, and, and you know, sh she didn't give you any indication that there might have been uh, further widespread cheating. And my concern is, if you rely so heavily on these other people's uh, investigation and, and opinions um, for leads, at what point do you take it on yourself uh, and, and to, to, to sort of explore some of these other schools where there were allegations that were made that were similar to noise? Well, I, I do dispute it strongly that we relied solely on, and I think at the last hearing I had with you, Council Member, you, you raised the question, and I indicated to you, and I think it's, indic it's reflected throughout our report, we didn't just rely on Cavion. We, we talked to teachers. We talked to parents. We talked to students. We, we, we talked to Did people. Did you talk to any teachers or students outside of those uh, yes. of the noise? Yes. Within the, as reflected in my testimony today, as reflected in the report, which is on our website, I indicated that one of the bases by which we decided not to expand, because I did a section, because we realized this, there would be concern about this, why we didn't expand beyond noise. We stated that the things we looked at were two main factors, specific allegations of wrongdoing, also in the course of interviewing individuals or people. Some of the people we interviewed were also at other schools. Let me ask this question. Yes. Were they at schools following a tenure at noise? I believe there may have been some, yes. So, so my point, my question is, did you talk to any teachers or parents who did not have a connection to noise elementary? Yes. So there was some before or after, from my understanding, yes. No, no. What, what I'm saying is, you said we talked to teachers who were no longer at Noise and were at other schools. No. I don't have the time to no, What I'm saying is that, as reflected in the report, we talked to people who, during that time frame that we were looking at, were also at other schools or had been at other well, schools. Why would you talk to, te to teachers at other schools? Be because they happened to be teachers who were at Noise who had been at, the, at, at, at some other school during the course of the year. That's my understanding. Okay, so did you talk to any teachers or parents of any of the other schools that were implicated? No, based on, I stand by the report, and, and the reason we did not, because we did not have specific allegations, and, and this is, you know, there's been much talk about Atlanta. One of the things with Atlanta, it wasn't just the, the experts who said that the, 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 uh, the, the erasures were such that, uh, um, that, the, 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 the rate of erasures rather mm -hmm. was such that they only could have occurred because of outside or improper influences. They also had specific allegations. They couldn't run solely as specific allegations, allegations from whom? From teachers, uh, principals, anybody. But perhaps because they talked to teachers outside of one single school. No, 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 no. That wasn't it at all. What happened was but they looked at, they went to people who came forth. They went, and they were interviewing people, and people came forth and indicated that there was cheating. Okay. And, that, and that, here's the other thing, the other key point that you have to remember. The allegations in Atlanta in the stated were that from the very top, the superintendent, chancellor, whomever, they were directing people below to cover up, not okay. to talk okay. to investigators, that sort of okay. thing. That's okay. evidence of widespread... But, but there's uh, also, and, and you, 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 you talked to me, and you also mentioned in the report how often you did rely on Cavion, and, and I have to say that, you know, um, I don't know if you know, but, but during the time we were conducting your investigation, Governor Sonny Perdue of, uh, of Georgia rejected Cavion's findings uh, and asked the Georgia Bureau of Investigations to investigate because they felt that Cavion's uh, findings were, uh, quote, uh, seeking to confine and constrain the damage from rapid cheating. Uh, they got state investigators to conduct a deep 10-month examination of Atlanta schools uh, because uh, it said the caveat vastly under underrepresented the extent of test tampering. 
of what I would respond to. But, 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 but I don't need to be aware of it because of this. You make it seem as if we relied solely on Kavanaugh. We did not. We conducted an independent investigation, just like with, with Mr. Sanford. Mr. Sanford, that... How many Democrats did you, did you speak to? We reached out, as, as reflected in the report, I think we've had this discussion before. Well, we reached out to 70-something odd parents. 23 responded back. So you talked to the parents. How many yeah. students did you talk to? We talked to, as I indicated, four students where the parents indicated that they granted permission for us to talk so to them. So 24 parents, four students, Caviar, and the Chancellor, who else did you talk to? Oh, we talked to monitors, uh, 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 support people. Were these monitors for, that, for noise? Well, I guess we talked... Were these monitors for noise? Some of, the, some of the people, some of the people, as reflected in the report, were from other schools also, or had been associated why, why, why didn't you expand your investigation beyond the scope of noise, uh, since you knew that there were, there were things that were associated with noise, but you also knew that there were other schools that had similar allegations? No, they did not. If you, if you please listen to what I'm saying and read the report, the report says that's why we didn't expand it, because there were no specific allegations, and the mere fact of wrong to right erasures, which everyone agrees, it does not mean that there was cheating. I mean, Chairperson Katani stated that and then when he went through the, 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 the so, so I just say, you know, I have a few minutes, a few seconds left. So what you're saying to me is, absent specific allegations, there's no basis uh, to go beyond the scope of looking at noise when there are other schools that had wrong or right erasures? Did you hire your own professional? Uh, 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 entity or, or to, to look at the erasures yourself? No, but there was no need. You had to, as, report, as reflected in the report, we said McGraw Hill and Caviar, you know, who interviewed their officials, but we also, they indicated that there was inconclusive evidence to determine if they were cheating. We had to look for the specific allegations. Sure. So there's, so there's more than that. You just can't, I mean, no one's going to initiate an investigation solely on... I, I just know, and I want to write the right answer. And it's actually going in the opposite direction. So I, I have to just say this. All right. Um, that in Atlanta, and I don't want to compare the district solely to Atlanta because I, I'm not familiar with all the allegations and all, all the things that transpired there. Uh, but there were 178 uh, schools implicated, I think, or people implicated, 100, I mean, 82 confessed. One of the 191 teachers uh, represented 70 schools that were initially outlined in the IC memo. Now, I know that that was based on incomplete information, but to me, uh, your investigation was woefully limited and it relied too heavily on people who had an interest and not discovering any cheating. Well, I, well, and and as, as I indicated for the record, I want to make it crystal clear, I strongly and vehemently disagree with that and refer you to all the reports. We did it. This was a joint investigation with the Department of Education. We worked closely with them and on that basis I just we and we just have to agree to disagree. But I strongly and vehemently disagree and I, I believe that any such characteriz characterization of the report in any negative way is woefully wrong, misguided and ill conceived. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, Mr. McDuffie. Um, I, I want to start with uh, Chancellor Henderson. Where do the documents from the DC CAS 2008, the underlying core documents, reside? In other words, the organic. Uh, the answer sheets, sheets. Yes. with the OSI. Okay, and is it your understanding that OSI has them in their possession or can, uh, can obtain them from the, the testing company if requested? I have no idea. I think that's a question for the OSI. All right. Uh, th that's important because, you, you know, as I look at the last few years of tests, so this most recent 2012, we have Asi hiring uh, Alvarez and Marcel, and we have their assessment. Last year, we have you hiring, DCPS hiring Alvarez and Marcel and their recommendations. We did it jointly with the Asi. And in 2010, it was Cavion doing the work. In 2009, Cavion was doing the work. But 2008, my question is, and you know, here we, we may never really know yep. what happened in 2008. Sure. And so because the record, the trail runs cold. My understanding is that we requested the answer oh, sheets. Oh. Sorry. Let, let me, if I could. Sorry. Um, you, you know, and so here we are engaged in the, the, the trail runs cold in 2008 because in 09, 010, 11, and 12, we have independent outsiders who, who review the information and who explain away or at least provide uh, uh, suggestions as to why these disparities might have occurred. And they're, and they're pretty, uh, 
you know, they're pretty plausible, uh, uh, you know, suggestions about, for instance, when there was instability in school, math teachers, you know, multiple math teachers one year, not the next. I mean, there are different focuses within each school. There are plausible uh, explanations for why there are uh, the schools that were the subject of the investigations or the heightened scrutiny had these kinds of improvements or kinds of de decreases. But in 08, again, I keep, sa I keep uh, looking for the evidence th uh, of a Cavion or an Alvarez and Marcel or someone to give the good housekeeping seal of approval, and it does not exist. That's right. What we have is uh, McGraw-Hill, our testing vendor, saying that right to wrong, I'm sorry, wrong to right answers alone does not suggest cheating because there are other extenuating circumstances, as was on display in the four subsequent years when, when evidence supported why there might be changes. And so, you know, I'm left with, you know, with wondering, you know, how do we pick up, how, how do we move beyond 2008 and the following? Uh, again, as of today, what we're trying to do is to get a district law that criminalizes the very activity we're reviewing, and that's the purpose of my bill. Uh, you know, going back five years uh, does seem to be a heavy uh, labor-intensive activity to try to find all of these schools and all of the individuals who may or may not have been implicated with times and uh, having transpired, the children being kind of scattered, the, the teachers being scattered in many instances to other schools, uh, memories fading and so on. How we will ever really know what happened in 08, and I don't believe we will, mm -hmm. one way or another. But what we do have is this memo uh, from January 30th, 2009, the Sandy Sanford memo mm -hmm. that does mention, you know, that there were possible testing infractions uh, that could have involved 70 schools uh, and 191 teachers. Um, and again, it suggests that, you know, serious ramifications, but the information is incomplete. You, I look at, at ATON as an illustration, you know, of an opportunity that has been missed perhaps forever to go back and have an explanation as to why Aton uh, had such high percentages of wrong to right erasures. And again, I just want the record to, to reflect that beyond, you know, kind of a, a tennis match of letters back and forth between OSSI and DCPS, beyond the suggestion by our testing vendor that one ought not to make, um, draw conclusions, we just never finally resolve the issues mm -hmm. of 08. Mm -hmm. Is that your understanding? That is my understanding. Now let me ask um, the Inspector General, if you don't mind. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, Mr. Inspector General, again, the 08 trail runs dry. Do we know why we did not pursue in, you know, where when we were constructing in 09, for instance, we asked Cavion to look at 09, we asked to look at 10. Can, can either member of this panel explain why we did not pursue an outside uh, investigation in the 08 matter, the 08 numbers? That, that, that um, the only thing I can think of, our initial investigation dealt with, uh, um, focused on um, noise, and I, that may have covered part of 08, but you're talking about beyond noise, I think. Well, I, I don't believe, um, Mr. Inspector General, that, that, you know, that we actually did do a universal good housekeeping seal of approval on 08. I see it in 09, I see it in 10 with Cavion, and 11 and 12 with Alvarez and Marcel. May I respond? Please. Yeah, yes. So, um, in 2008, um, we knew enough to know that we did not know enough about the flagging methodologies and how to conduct investigations to look for outside help, which is why we hired Dr. Sanford. Dr. Sanford recommended when, this, when these flagging methodologies were confusing and inconclusive that we hire Cavion, and that was the thing that led DCPS to hire Cavion. Again, we didn't hire them at the instruction of the OSSI or anybody else. We hired them because, and at that time, um, all we knew was we had lots of information that said something might have happened. So out of an abundance of caution, we hired the people who uh, we knew to be best in the industry to help us figure this out. We didn't, we didn't know that in 2008, we didn't even actually have the, the information that we were getting from the OSSI. Each time we got information from the OSSI, it was a different set of data. And so um, 
we hired Caveat. The, to the takeaway, Chancellor, is this uh, that, you know, Caveat was hired in spring of 09 mm -hmm. to prepare and analyze the spring of 09 yes. math scores going forward. Uh, the 08 issue, though, okay. uh, again, outside of McGraw Hill saying you cannot make and draw conclusions, we have nothing <coughs> beyond that. And I think it is an opportunity lost because we had unusual uh, wrong to right answers. I mean, these things happen for a variety of reasons. We had unusual spikes and declines in test scores in, in, in the uh, years 9, 10, 11, and 12. And these reports were able, and, and, and they're available on, uh, publicly if people want to see exactly why, you know, these uh, changes are plausible. So sure. we didn't identify them and walk away, but we did not do that with the 70 schools that were somehow implicated. So I tried to reverse engineer myself, Chancellor, to see you know, some of these schools. And, and, and this, is a, this is a larger issue going forward. I'm glad Ossie's in the room. I am underwhelmed by the current <coughs> methodology for flagging mm -hmm. propriety. Yeah. That you have to kind of jump through a couple of hoops before you get uh, you know, scrutiny. And so it does have the effect of narrowing the mm -hmm. schools and the classes that are the subject. I, I think it is inadequate. And again, part of going forward in a constructive way as we prepare for this year's cast, I think there needs to be some absolute random testing, a random uh, strength uh, of, uh, of our systems testing, and not simply you have to follow yep. into this very narrow, because we are attempting, I feel like we're trying to manage this situation by narrowing investigations, and we narrow ourselves into a conclusion that we don't have a problem. Yep. All right? Um, but I also don't see, and we will never, I don't believe, know what happened in 08. And for people who know anything about investigations, going back five years after the fact, with no, no criminal law, with no statutes, I mean, with, 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 with any issue of, of common law fraud, statute of limitations, I'm sure, have expired, and with individuals scattered throughout the system, uh, and with memories fading, and the fact that co the, the cooperation of all the entities, most importantly the students, would be, this would be a very difficult, expensive, and I don't mean dismiss the importance of it, but it's weighing that versus fixing this going forward. And most importantly, to one of my colleagues' points, doubling down on improving school performance in a real, sustainable, measurable way. But I will say this, and I, I, because I don't want to sugarcoat this, there are some proficiency growth because we will never know we will not know, for instance, why Winston had a 30.9% jump, okay, which amounts to a 297% increase in CAS scores. Why Baloo had a 14.5% increase in proficiency, which amounted to a 241% increase. Why Anacostia High School, for instance, had a 10.2% jump, 148% increase. And, and frankly, why Smothers and why Prospect and why so many others in that era had, had, had numbers that are easy to challenge and for, for people who are inclined to believe in the various acts can look and say, you can't prove it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And they are right. They are right. We cannot prove it didn't happen. So my time has expired. I will ask uh, for one more 10 minute round of this panel. Uh, and then I, I, wanna, I, I want you, Chancellor, and Asi to, you know, let's just liberate ourselves of this desire to manage an embarrassing situation and let's engage in more rigorous, uh, less restrictive integrity uh, uh, efforts going forward. Right. Can I respond to that Please. quickly? Um, so you asked what we could do going forward, and I think one of the challenges is that there is no agreed upon standard for flagging. And so whatever flagging methodology anybody uses is open to question. This year, Aussies is tighter than last year. They have a technical advisory committee. I'm sure they'll talk to you about that. But we have to agree upon a standard for flagging because what works for one place, other people then discount. Same is true with the standard for investigation, and I think, um, I think we've seen that through the exchange here. We have to agree, agree upon what is the appropriate investigation that will make us feel like we have the information that we need to rest assured. 
DCPS welcomes the investigation. I don't want to spend my time trying to defend something while I can't prove that um, the results um, that the results were infallible. I can also prove that something did happen, and I have that obligation to my teachers and my principals. And so, nobody more than me would like to have systems in place where you don't have to ask what I believe about it, where we actually agree on the standard. Well, uh, Chancellor, thank you. I'm I'm over my time, but I want to again underscore uh, the need not to set up. Uh, and I, I appreciate you've got a whole industry. This is not. This is. You have a whole industry that is kind of engineered to both uh, alleviate public's concerns and at the same time not, uh, not accelerate those concerns. And by creating very narrow multiple steps before an issue you know, rises to the level of investigation, it has the ability or it has the tendency to narrow what, who is investigated and how, which mm -hmm. makes it appear as if, well, there's nothing to see here, move along. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm very eager to see a discussion about random, you know, so, so throw out these ideas. I mean, you, you, you can have uh, an algorithm where you should do it. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't. But then you should have other item, items where it's just a random. Yeah. Because for this year, for instance, you know, not, I don't want to, to call in and to question any of the results, but there have been unusual increases in this 11 and 12. Uh, you know, and I look at schools that have more than a 50% increase in improvement. Right, right now, I want to know why. Mm -hmm. I want to know why because that, that could indicate something nefarious is underway. And at the same time, it can indicate something good going on. A reason to learn. You know, Stanton's increase of 148%, I believe, is a function of the turnaround that is going on. But there are others. Anytime I see that, regardless of whether or not bells and whistles go off, I want to know why. Yep. And I don't have the confidence that that's what we're doing right now. I went in by saying that the growth in the CAS scores from 2007 to 2012, we have seen an increase uh, from an average of 36.5% proficiency to 42.2. We have seen growth. But it is down from, I believe, that the 0809, uh, we had some accelerated rates, rates that, you know, that, that we, we don't have now, which indicates to me, while I can't prove it, that there that that that, that we had uh, some assistance. Let me put it that way. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Grasso. Mr. Grasso. Thank you very much. Um, just for clarification, Chancellor Henderson, which which DCPS teachers have DC CAS scores as part of their impact score? Um, anybody who is in a tested grade and subject area, so third through eighth grade teachers. Um, and 10th grade teachers. So what percentage of the workforce is that? It's about 13%. 13 and how long has it been that way? Mm, since, I guess this is the fourth year. So it wasn't that way in 2008? It was not. What was it in 2008? In 2008, we had uh, no test scores counted for your evaluation. And nine, not uh, until four years ago? or did Four years ago, this is in our fourth year of impact, no, so. Right, so, so you just used it then as an assessment tool on how well things were moving forward and as a requirement from No Child Left Beyond. The CAS? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, what percentage in 2008 of the system was traditional school versus charter school? I don't know off the top of my head. Do you, was it, I mean, generally, I mean, you don't have any idea? No. Okay. Um, I mean, the reason I'm asking is because you know, I realize you're on the hot seat for this issue, and, and I'm just trying to get the public to understand that it was a lot higher percentage back then than today of what percentage of charter students. schools? No, we're in oh, the schools, public schools and DC yes. public schools. And so as the head of that LEA, you know, today, that's kind of why you have to answer these questions. And so sure. I'm trying to just let people understand that yes. um, there's a role there. And that, and, I I guess I would add that um, while we're only talking about DCPS, in all of these investigations, at least the ones that the Aussies have done, charters have been implicated as That's well. Right. And I want people to understand that yeah. um, it's just a little heavier on you because sure. of the, the shift. And I think it'll, hopefully it will remain that way as we move forward as we grow DCPS. I working on it. Right? So, um, so you, you were working with DCPS in 2008 for the record, right? Yes. And what was your position then? I was the deputy chancellor in charge for hu in charge of human capital. What does human capital mean? Human capital is getting and keeping great people. So I was responsible for human resources, um, teacher effectiveness, principal effectiveness, central office effectiveness, and our labor relations. Did you have any involvement with the DC CAS 
you know, the application of it, the, the I did not. Um, if when uh, when there were infractions, testing improprieties, and a personnel action had to be carried out, be then I'd in. be brought in. So you were brought in then after this all happened? Yeah, to make uh, changes. I wasn't brought in in 2008 because we didn't have right. anybody to fire. Um, but later on, through the when we got reports that said there was a person implicated, um, then my labor management employee relations uh, group would look at the infraction and determine whether it required a letter of reprimand, removal from the testing environment, or termination. And how many uh, employees uh, after the 2008 CAS testing were, or actually I guess the report on cheating was, were fired or About 12 that we actually terminated. Um, and that and would have been in 09 or 10? That um, is over the course of the last few years. Okay. Um, and, and some of them, were, by the time we got the report, were no longer employees of DCPS, so we couldn't take any personnel action. Right. So about 12 people and ultimately had to act, you had to actively act on. Yes. Um, Fire. We uh, also issued letters of reprimand or remove people from the test. How many did you do that for? Mm, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can get you a breakdown year by year. I mean, a um, handful of people each how year. About how many have you done? How, how many people have been affected throughout, you know, the total use of DCCAS, you know, for the past, what, since 2008 to today? Um, based on... Based on not on uh, results of CAS, right? That's one thing. But based on cheating allegations or yeah. So twelve terminated, and I'd have oh, to total. Get That's you. a total of yes. six years. Yes. Okay. All right. So then I can get you the number who left DCPS that we would have terminated, and how many letters of reprimand. I just don't have that. But it's not a hundred. It's not a hundred. No. No, it's way I less. Don't. All right. Well, you know, as as you can understand, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get kind of an idea of your role in all of this and sure. what your thoughts, you know, and how you were, you know, kind of affected by this in your career and yeah. where you are today. If you want to reflect on that some more, I'll give you some more time. Sure, great. Um, I've been, I guess, accused of being, uh, having seen this memo, I want to state for the record and remind people that I'm under oath. The first time that I ever saw the Sandy Sanford memo was in January of this year. John Merrill reported of it, and I had to ask my staff, what is the Sandy Sanford memo? <laughs> Can I see it? Um, and it's been alleged that I have been in, I had been in meetings with former Chancellor Ree about this issue. Um, I, this is not something that I would have been engaged in in the scope of my responsibilities at that time. Um, I actually feel like the time when I became most engaged in testing integrity issues were really um, with the USA Today article, which came out just a couple of months after I became the chancellor. And immediately, um, when that issue was raised, I think the day after, um, I called for an investigation with the Inspector General. Because for us, um, I feel good about the work that we're doing every day, and I want other people to feel good about the work that we're doing every day. And so um, we want to get to the bottom of it, and we want to, you know, utilize every tool in our toolbox to get to the bottom of it. And I think um, that's what I've done since I've been engaged in this work. Yeah, well, I'm with you. I I'd like to see your, you know, your good work promoted, and I think it should be able to stand on its own. And I think that's what we're up against here when you have uh, questions of integrity. Sure. That's true not just for your results but for all of us. Yeah. And um, so that's why I'm so hard and want to know what you're doing to plan for the future on yeah. this regard. And, uh, and, I and I would, I'd like to ask the chairman if he would um, be okay with it, if you could submit to us a plan um, in a reasonable amount of time on how you're going to address the future Common Core assessments um, and how they're going to be done, not just from a, I don't really want to know as much about, you know, what your plan is to make sure there's integrity. I, I imagine you'll be working on that. I want to know what you're going to do to make sure our whole system is prepared for those Common Core testing. Uh, this is a I believe if they're going to be take on computers, that's a hurdle that we have to overcome. We've heard about it in hearing after hearing after hearing. How are you going to do that and how are you going to ensure, therefore, that there's integrity in that process? Yep. Can we get I a could, report? Would that be okay with you, yeah. Chairman? Uh, in the next I can give you a brief overview now, but I could, uh, we, I'm happy to provide you with a report. I, I want a, uh, 
I want a sophisticated sure. plan and report and a brief interview or a brief overview now is not enough. So okay. um, That's take easy your to time, do. get it right, and yep. then get back to us maybe before recess. So yep. that no would problem. be July 15th. So we can understand where we're going from here sure. for preparing for that complete change in the way we're doing things. That would be great. I'm, I think it's an opportunity for us to show that we're ahead of most other school districts in preparing for um, the park. So I welcome the opportunity. The park. What's the park? The park for? is the new exam that that's will come with the Common Core. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that, I think that would be okay if that's good. Okay with you, Chairman Stanley, and reasonable time frame. Look forward to reading that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Grasso. Mr. McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chancellor, I want to uh, ask a, just a couple of questions. When the the teacher evaluations and test scores are tied uh, to a certain extent, right? What's the percentage? Uh, initially, in the first uh, two years, 50% of the teacher evaluation was determined by the value added of the test scores. Um, and then this past year, um, we shifted that for, for teachers in tested grades and subject areas. And teachers not in tested grades and subject areas, it was a teacher assessed student achievement goal. Um, we're now at a point where 35% of the um, of teachers and of the evaluation of teachers in tested grades and subject areas is the value added of their test scores. Fifteen percent is a teacher assessed student achievement model. What, what prompted that uh, that reduction from fifty percent to thirty five percent? So it's still fifty percent total. It's just using multiple measures of student achievement. But we made the change primarily because um, we went out and heard from teachers about what they thought um, would we, changes we needed to make to strengthen the evaluation system. And in fact, um, many of our best teachers felt angst about the 50%, um, suggested the 35%. When we looked at the cut, there actually wasn't a, a real difference. Um, their scores wouldn't have been much different. And so we felt like it was a welcome change to make if our teachers felt more comfortable with the evaluation system that way. Um, but I want to say very clearly that I think we moved in this direction because um, you know, the vast majority of teachers, almost all teachers, were rated as meets or exceeds expectations with no accounting of student achievement. And I do feel very strongly that we have to take student achievement into account in terms of how we evaluate our teachers. Is there any concern in, in that, that the, the emphasis that's placed on uh, the test results and how that's tied to teacher evaluations, is there any concerns that that has or, or might motivate individuals? I know sure. it's part of the speculation, yeah. but... No, I mean, absolutely. I think we, you know, knew that this could be a possibility, and I think this is in part why uh, we've been diligent about trying to follow the test integrity protocols, um, trying to add test integrity protocols. Um, we want to, you know, we want to set up a situation where people who um, do great things for kids are recognized and rewarded, and the vast majority of our teachers are doing that. Um, in any system, I think there's always a handful of bad actors, and so our job is to try to um, motivate bad actors to not do things by putting precautions in place, but then to find them on the back end. And I think we are um, getting more sophisticated, but um, I don't think that we're foolproof yet, and we'll continue to work to the point that we do. What I don't want people to take away is that, you know, um, standardized testing is bad, or that um, using student achievement as part of a teacher evaluation is a bad thing, because that's not what I fundamentally believe. When I talk to our teachers um, who um, are actually seeing movement, many of them who are minimally effective and are now effective or highly effective, it's because of this evaluation by looking at their, what their classroom practice and looking at what they do with students that we're able to give them the feedback and the professional development and align our, our training to where their students are short and to where they are short. Mr. Willoughby, yes. um, I think most people agree with, with you and, and, and folks who've stated that you can't conclude that there's been cheating strictly based on the percentage of wrong to right ratios. But uh, in your investigation, did you ever consult uh, any outside expert to review uh, the wrong to right ratios to make your own determination for the purpose of your investigation? No, other than we did, cons we did consult, I think we did consult one, and I guess in the response to your letter, I think we did talk to, um, I can't remember the name of the, um, 
what organization they were with, but we did consult one person, I think. And, and we talked to people at Cavion and um, McGraw Hill. So they're, they're experts in the area, yes. But we did. To have uh, an expert who came in and actually, I think, physically did a performed an analysis of some sort, I don't believe. No, we didn't know. We didn't contract with someone for that. No. Did you feel comfortable? I'm sorry, do you want to add something? Uh, the, the Chancellor, uh, Mr. Inspector General, I apologize for that. I just had to, is, is my mic on? Uh, I, I had to uh, consult with a colleague, Mr. McDuffie, because the Chancellor needs to go oh, okay. catch a plane. And I, so I asked him if he had any additional questions of her. He said no. Okay. I actually have a few, so I'm going to just, okay. uh, uh, I'm going to take five minutes <coughs> to ask her her questions, and I'll return to Mr. McDuffie. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Chancellor Henderson, when did you first learn of this memo? January of 2013. And when you uh, when you learned about this memo, who in your staff did you discuss this with? Uh, I asked uh, Pete Weber, um, Melissa Salmanowitz, who's my Pete Weber is my chief of strategy. Melissa Salmanowitz is my press secretary, and uh, Lisa Ruda is my chief of staff. Um, if any of them knew about. I, I asked Melissa because the John Merrow report is the first time I ever heard of the Sandy Sanford memo. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you learned of the memo in January. Yes. How did you learn of this January 30th, 2009 memo? How did, that, how did it come to your attention? In John Merrow's reporting at the time um, on this this was w when he was reporting about Adele Cawthorn. I think this was when that a uh, segment of his show was airing. I don't believe he, though, made reference to this January 30th, 2009 memo until last week. He, no, that's not true. He talked about the Sandy Sanford memo. In fact, I think we got a FOIA request for it, um, but it was that in I January. Know. That I know. And he, he attempted, according to him, to get this from you, but could not. That's my understanding as well. Why, just out of curiosity, why not hand it over to him? I don't. I, we have. I don't do anything around FOIAs, so uh -huh. it didn't come to me to say, "Do we want to turn this over or not?" Well, My legal office. department is the Office of General Counsel that determines what goes out and what doesn't go out. So he, he, in his conversations with me, he told me he tried to obtain a copy of it, was rebuffed, but was able to get another copy, which again goes to a certain degree of suspicion. Adds to suspicion. Yep. Uh, who on your staff had, where did, who, who, uh, who physically gave you? Melissa Salmano, it's my press secretary. Uh -huh. And where did she obtain it? I, uh, I assume she attained it, attained it from our Office of Data and Accountability. And who is in charge of that office now? Um, right now, Pete Weber is the acting um, director of that office. And Chancellor, uh, did you have an occasion to ask Mr. Weber or uh, Ms. Rudolph or any of your other senior staff uh, when they first became aware of this memo? Yes, I did. And what did they say? Um, none of us knew about the memo before we um, asked the, the uh, before we got it from the ODA staff. All right. And who would then, did you, was there any uh, effort on your part to get to the bottom of who might have known about this and why they didn't share it with you? I called Aaron McGoldrick, who is the former Chief of Data and Accountability, and who was working tell, with... Did Aaron tell you who knew or didn't know within within the she did not ranks. tell me who knew or didn't know did you ask um, no I don't okay. think so uh, tell me uh, in light of this because it, 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 it raised <coughs> some serious questions you agree to that right yes um, uh, when did you share this memo with Mayor Gray um, I I don't know if I've shared an actual copy of the memo with Mayor Gray uh, at any time has Mayor Gray called you to specifically request a discussion on the testing integrity issues in the District of Columbia? He does not, but I've raised the testing integrity issues in our weekly check-ins. So as this has progressed, I've kept him updated. Yeah, Chancellor, uh, you know, what I find a little perplexing, candidly, is the aggressiveness of other state governors, uh, most uh, particularly Governor Purdue in Georgia, having, because they, they have uh, investigative authority and, and capabilities, certainly in the district, because the Attorney General at present rests under the authority of the mayor. What I find a little disconcerting is that there seems not to be the focus within the executive ever on this subject to want to call you and raise it specifically. Well, I think one, um, as I said, I've been updating him. Um, I made him aware of my desire to 
uh, asked the Inspector General to investigate. I've kept him up to date to the extent that we've known on the other investigations, and he's seen the results of those investigations, and I think um, like many of us, when investigation after investigation after investigation confirms that there's no widespread cheating, um, I think that um, he well, that has... Comes, Chancellor, respectfully, that comes from doing one's work and knowing that and being intellectually curious enough to ask the question, not waiting passively for your Chancellor to raise the issue with you, because he's responsible for all 47 LEAs, not just DCPS. And so one would wonder how he is engaged. If you yourself have to engage him on behalf of one of the 47 school systems, was he waiting for the other 46 school systems to tell him whether there was a problem or not? I can't. Actually, the ASI uh, plays a role as well, and I can't speak to what he might have done with them. Well, uh, let me just, um, because I know you have to go, so I'm just going to, in the same vein, I'm going to ask the uh, Inspector General. Mr. Inspector General, you issued your report on testing integrity last August, is that right? Yes. Um, at any time has the mayor uh, requested a briefing from you on the subject? No. Thank you. Um, Chancellor, I understand you have a flight to catch. I want to thank you very much for being here on short notice. I certainly appreciate thank your you. cooperation. Thank you. Look forward to working with you and fixing this issue going forward. And Likewise. I, I do want to say that the concerns raised by Mr. Grosso about how we get on track are ones that are shared by the whole committee, and I think that's why our energies are best focused on fixing test integrity going forward and, and putting our energies and marshalling our resources to getting uh, the very best education of our children today instead of litigating you know, what we may or may not be able to find out from five years ago. So and I look you. forward to working with you to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, um, Mr. McDuffie, thank you for allowing me to interrupt your line of questions. Would you uh, please put six minutes on the clock uh, so that Mr. McDuffie may finish his questions of the Inspector General? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think she's already gone, but I want to thank Chancellor Henderson as well for uh, providing testimony here today and agreeing to work with the committee uh, to really try to root out some of the issues uh, that are at play here today. And, and I don't think that my, my, my Final questions are going to take up the entire five minutes, uh, Mr. Willoughby. But I do want to uh, go back to what we were discussing about the investigation. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you said that you did utilize the caveat investigation for the purpose of trying to generate leads. Leads, yeah. Yes. Okay, and did that investigation generate any leads? Well, it, it helped us with background information on processes and whatever, but excuse me, yes, I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Inspector okay. General, may we uh, ask for <laughs> to the table if he has information that's relevant, uh, but Please I do need him to, to, okay. to raise his right hand. Uh, do you swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will give the committee is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please you state your name and, and assist in... Uh, answering Mr. McDuffie's questions. Thank you. My name is Denmark Slay. Mr. Slay, thank yes, you for joining us. And Mr. Slay is, is the director within our investigations division. This was just out of an efficiency perspective. Exactly. As to you the, the exactly. No, I understand Slay, exactly. I thank you very much. Assist with the answers. So, I guess the question is, were you aware that uh, the Georgia State uh, during this course of their investigation that they dismissed the findings that Caveon had made related to the uh, Atlanta cheating investigation? Oh, uh, no, sir, I was not. Okay. Um, did you all, during the course of your investigation, ever become aware that Caveon had uh, provided an investigation uh, of Atlanta's cheating allegations that were dismissed? No, but I will say this, as I've indicated in the previously, the fact that they were dismissed or not dismissed is not, if we, if we had relied solely on the caveat, that'd be one thing. The nature of our investigation was to determine whether or not there was misconduct or cheating within the administration of the test in question during the period of time. So consequently, whether they were dismissed or not didn't make any difference. It, it, what we were looking at was actual getting evidence of specific conduct that constituted or amounted to cheating of some sort. And my, my inquiry is looking at um, what you did and what your office's investigation consisted of to try to discover specific evidence of cheating uh, outside of looking at the allegations at Norris. Uh And that's, that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. You mentioned previously that there was a joint investigation with the U.S. Department of Education. What, what did that 
agreement and joint investigation consist of? I think as reflected in our report, uh, um, they jointly investigated um, 48, I think we conducted at least 48 interviews. That's this appears on their website. They also, um, I can tell you, they shared information when they were able regarding, regarding the Queen Town ladder, um, regarding Ms. Carthorn and, and, and the memo from Mr. Sanford. Um, for the, the bulk of the time we worked together, they were unable to supply that information to us. Do they look at specific allegations of cheating in, in D.C. as it relates to the actual schools that were implicated? Yes, because they were looking from a different perspective as to whether or not um, funds were, were, I guess, uh, um, disseminated or distributed based upon um, some manipulation of the test scores. So, so that's what I want to get at, because I want to know if they were sort of in the nuts and bolts of these allegations as it relates to individual schools, or were they looking more on a macro level uh, of what the DCPS officials knowingly submitted false information for the purpose of receiving federal funds? Well, my understanding, they were in the nuts and bolts with some of these interviews, weren't they, at the schools? Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. On our investigation? Yes, yes, sir. They were, they accompanied us. We, I mean, we uh, did the interviews jointly together uh, with respect to our investigation. Okay. And did you, in turn, receive any information from the investigation that, that you relied on for the purpose of issuing your report? Yes. One major thing that we received was, well, they gave us leads regarding Ms. Cawthorn, um, as I've indicated, we attempted to reach out to Ms. Cawthorn initially because she was a principal at Noyes. Right. Um, when we reached out to her, as I've indicated previously, we got a call from her attorney indicating that she did not want... How many other schools were, were, were implicated uh, with possible cheating in terms of wrong and right erasures in D.C. during the same testing period? Well, based on the, the, when we got the report, it looks like there, there may have been, what, 70 or whatever, mm -hmm. but we had specific allegations regarding noise, and we focused on noise and Where did you get those specific allegations? When we went to, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Well, yeah, you can explain that to them, <laughs> please. Well, um, the, um, uh, I guess the impetus for uh, focusing on noise was partly because of, or, or primarily because of the uh, USA Today article. Um, and our initial concern, or again, focusing on noise, uh, had a lot to do with the fact that they had received the, the monetary awards uh, for, I think it's 06. Right, but, but how did you decide that noise was the only school that needed the, 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 the focus of your resources from your office? Initially, as we pointed out in our report, we focused on noise initially because of the articles in the USA Today and information from DCPS. We, that's how we focused on them. Is that typically how you decide what investigations to conduct and the scope of those investigations around on media? Uh, but we, we rely on many sources, yes. And yeah, that's not unusual. We, we initiate, self-initiate many investigations based on what appears in the newspaper. That's not unusual. Well, when we talked about the 2008 uh, 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 test as well, and I don't think you all decided to look at the 2008 test. Once it mentioned about 2008, we, we looked at noise because the focus was in the newspaper initially and information from DCPS. We started initially there. As we moved through, it, if we found anything, I guess, uh, any specific allegations about other schools, we may have checked out some parts of that. But the focus was on noise. And once we completed that, and we did not have additional information uh, alleging widespread uh, 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 um, cheating, and we didn't have specific allegations, the mere data, and, and, and we laid all this out in the report. And, and, and the reason I made sure we laid it out, because I knew that this would be something of concern. And the fact was that we had to have some basis. We weren't going on a fishing expedition. We couldn't get... Sure, I, I don't think anyone expects you all to go on a fishing expedition, but I do think that folks expect you all to conduct thorough investigations and not to rely solely on allegations that are made in the media. Obviously, you take leads and you get information when you hear reports that come up in the media, but if there, if, if there is information that implicates a number of schools, there should at least be some sort of cursory review some outreach to, to some of these other schools and that we did. We did based upon the as we if, as we stated, we initiated this with focusing on memories. Then when we got specific allegations of things and we did not get 
specific allegations that amounted to uh, we found some well, 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 Mr. Willoughby, yeah. and, and, and I hate to interrupt. That's but, all right. But I, yeah, I just want to emphasize, Mr. Chair, um, and I'm focusing on this investigation because obviously the issues are here, but it really, to me, strikes a chord in terms of the confidence that this body and the city has on the thoroughness and quality of your investigations going forward. Uh, hopefully we won't have any future allegations of cheating, but if you do, uh, I hope that you all would do a better job of really uh, delving a little deeper and trying to find information to support uh, whether or not there's actually cheating in other schools, uh, even if there's only one mention of a school in the newspaper. So uh, I thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chairman. No, I just would like to respond. I stand by the report of the Office of the Inspector General. I think it's an excellent report. It's a report that it was based upon a joint investigation. I think that while people may not have agreed with the results of it, I believe that it's a thorough, complete in, uh, investigation based on the evidence we were able to turn up. I would just add, finally, say this, that for me, as Inspector General, to find that there's a basis of misconduct, of uh, 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 misbehavior, um, where I believe there's not a basis for concluding such, would be a dereliction election of my duty. I take my position very seriously. And I think, as members of this council know, I'm very responsible. Um, I'm very responsive to the request from the federal council, and, and um, I take uh, I stand behind the report. It's a good report, um, and I just like that to be on the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Willoughby. Just uh, to telegraph, uh, I'll have one more ten-minute round with Mr. Willoughby. We'll then recess for five minutes, so Mr. Grasso and I can go next door and vote on a finance and revenue matter. We will then reconvene at approximately. Um, 1115 for our testing integrity bill, the underlying legislation. Uh, what I will do in the course of that legislation and in the course of my discussions with OSSI, I will raise the issues that I might have that will kind of carry over. But we do have public witnesses that were scheduled here at 10 and out of, uh, you know, they've already been very patient in this accommodation of an additional hour. I do want to give the public witnesses who've come down here a chance to testify and we'll fold in their rest. And so, uh, you know, to telegraph to the Deputy Mayor for Education and our Aussie representative uh, especially, I, I, I would, would request that you stay uh, in the chamber for purposes of answering questions about this in the next hearing. So, uh, Mr. Inspector General, when did you first, you personally, first learn of this uh, January uh, 20th memo, I'm sorry, January 30th, 2009 memo uh, from Sandy Sanford? I became aware of it I want to say it was around the issue of um, the, a FOIA request was received in the office. So that so would have been when? In some time um, um, t last year. And I would, I would say that it would be, we did not even become aware of the, the memo and the investigation somewhere between April and July of last year, 2012. So between April and July. Now, your, your report was issued in August. August, exactly. So somewhere between the spring and early summer of last year, you became aware of this memo. How did, you, how did this memo come into your possession? We received it from the Department of Education. Because it was part of their investigation. Exactly. It was part of the quintan that had been under seal. Sure. So who in your office re was responsible for reviewing this memo? In other words, it comes in. It claims that there might, again, from the 2008, that it may involve uh, possible testing infractions of, you know, again, information is incomplete, stipulate, but there might be 191 teachers representing 70 schools that are implicated. Who was responsible? There was an agent assigned in the investigations division. All right, can who? you explain to us why that might not have piqued your curiosity? Now, I understand why your investigation may have started around noise. Uh, elementary because of the uh, the the blue ribbon uh, uh, assignment, some of additional funds, et cetera. It had been flagged in a couple of years of testing um, in eight and nine and ten. I understand that, but I don't understand. And perhaps you can explain why, when this memo came into your possession, uh, you you didn't um, perhaps expand your investigation. Well, I can say it did pique our curiosity. We interviewed Mr. Sanford. And, we, and in the course of that interview, he indicated to us that he had not done any sort of investigation. He had merely reviewed some documentation that, um, and when we looked at the, the, the document itself, on its face, it clearly indicates, it's inconclusive, it clearly indicates that, that, it, that no final determinations were made in this. And in fact, if you look, I think it's on page two of that document, it makes reference to the fact that, well, 
could other could one person have done any of the infractions or erased the information? Mr. Inspector General, again, I'd like to understand, though, so Mr. Sanford is reviewing information that someone else has constructed. In other words, I could understand my office, we were able to reverse, we were able to construct the data increases from seven to eight, and we see where some, you know, where interests get peaked. But we would not be able to ascertain that there were 191 teachers perhaps implicated. How did Mr. Sanford come to the understanding or the appreciation that there might be individual teachers involved? The information that it, it, it was, it was part of, from my understanding, was that the information that was sent to DCPS was from OSSI. It was a letter requesting, I think it's that November 21st, 2008 letter, if, I, if, I, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct. And there, there, and there was some background material attached to that. It was a letter requesting that DCPS initiate some sort of investigation based on test erasure um, statistics that 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 OSI had compiled. That what happened was Mr. Sanford, from, from our understanding, was who was he's an educational consultant, was working at DCPS. Ms. McGoldrick, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Uh, on January 28th, as you indicated in your chronology, approached him, asked, showed him this information, told, asked him to take a look at it, and let him know, let, 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 let her know what he thought. Two days later, he produced the, the memo. Did, in your, did you, were you a part of the uh, interview of Mr. Saunders? Sanford, no, I was Sanford, not. Brother, I'm sorry, no. And um, uh, were, were you, sir? Uh, no, sir. Okay, is anyone here who was? No, the person is no longer employed with the office. This, this is, again, these things complicate <laughs> investigations. But I can tell you this, we do have, a, the reason we know, we have a summary of the, uh, of, of the interview that was... Um, so we don't know, for instance, why, you know, why there wasn't in 2008, based on these concerns raised by OSSI, have it memorialized here. We don't know why, do we? DCPS or OSSI did not ask for an 08 a kind of uh, review as they offer, ask for an 09 and 010 with Cavion and 11 and 12 with Alvarez and Marcel. We don't know why the decision was made to let the sleeping dog lie, do we? Only I can think is, and I'm trying to the way I saw this, I think they were approaching the new test season coming up and they, they, they wouldn't complicate. Um, I think th there, there was some problem from a logistical standpoint. I think that's what I, I seem to recall. But no, but we, but we don't know. And, and I can tell you this much too. Mr. Sanford, once he, he did this draft in two days, whatever, he produced this document, our information is he never was asked to do anything else regarding uh, the matter. With respect to your, uh, the Inspector General's report that was issued last August, it does discuss noise mm -hmm. Testing in 0809, uh, 910, I'm sorry, uh, 7889, 910. Uh, so it does attempt to look at, or it does purport, I, I guess, to look at what happened in uh, 06, 07, 07, 08. Exactly, that's what I was saying. Yes. It does, but yeah. the difference, though, uh, Mr. Inspector General, is that all of the findings relate to what happened in the 09 test. There are no findings as it relates to the 08 test. And so once again, we're left to wonder, you know, what happened in 08? Uh, and again, you know, I want to end uh, by, by reading, you know, because I understand you did this investigation jointly with the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Education. You know, and many, many uh, prosecutorial and investigative eyes have looked at this. And, and we have not been able to establish leads that were unresearched un, un or uninterviewed. Uh, we don't have the situation in Atlanta where people came out of the woodwork on hotlines and made accusations that were substantiated. And, and in fact, everything we see in 09 perspective uh, has been investigated and resolved. And but but 08 lingers there, um, and that that I think is where we are at the conclusion of this hearing. And I think the chancellor reiterated why in 08 a decision was not made similar to 9 and 10, 11 and 12, the higher and outsider. To, uh, to, to review this further. Um, and so we, that, of course, makes the environment rich for speculation. Exactly. But I, I will say that all the reports I've read continue to re reiterate, whether it's from your office, Cavion's, to Alvarez and Marcel's, to uh, the McGraw-Hill analysis, 
the, uh, DC, the Inspector General for Department of Education and the, the Civil and the Criminal Division of the U.S. Attorney's Office find no evidence of widespread cheating uh, and find no evidence of knowledge at the upper echelon of DCPS, which is a massive departure from what was uncovered in Atlanta. But because these holes in your investigation exist, it does provide a fertile ground for people to speculate. And I, I do share um, my colleague, uh, Mr. McDuffie's, uh, concern about how narrowly this investigation was focused, for whatever reason. Uh, we would be in a very different position had it been broader, and so this is a coulda, woulda, shoulda. Um, the issue is does it make sense going forward to have all of our resources trying to reconstruct what happened in that one year, or do we try, as I hope to, uh, perfect or at least as close as perfection as possible, construct a system going forward? I, I want to end by putting on the record how this hearing came about and how the release of this 2009 memo came into my possession. I was. I was uh, contacted by John Merrow, who is this reporter, uh, who is responsible for the frontline piece on Michelle Ree and who has a point of view on the subject. I was approached by uh, a phone and email two weeks ago. Uh, I spoke with Mr. Merrow, and he told me he had this memo in his possession and that it had very damning implications for DCPS. And he asked for my reaction. And my reaction was obvious. Unless I can see it and review it, I don't know you, Mr. Murrow. You're calling me on the phone. I'm not going to take anyone's word. And I, I've kind of been in this business long enough to know that reporters can bait you into getting a point of view that fulfills their own interests. And so when I asked, I did, again, consistent with what I believe to be my responsibilities, I asked over the phone in the presence of staff for a copy of the memo so I could then review it and then provide him some comments. He refused. I then sent him a separate email where I reminded him that I had asked for it in over the phone, and once again, because in order to fulfill my responsibilities, if there are allegations in our system, I need to know, and I asked again for this memo from Mr. Murrow. He responded in email, refusing to give it to me. He, although in our verbal conversations, he let me know who had this particular uh, document. One of the individuals he mentioned was the Inspector General. I phoned the Inspector General and asked for a copy. And to his considerable credit, within an hour, it was in my inbox. There was not a hesitation. And I appreciate that, Mr. Willoughby. Oh. I reviewed the, 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 the memo and then asked my staff to begin reverse engineering to see if we could identify on our own the 70 schools where there might have been unbelievable increases. And I fortunately have a very good data person who does excellent work on behalf of this committee. In the process, I did a courtesy to Mr. Murrow. I emailed him and told him I was able to obtain a copy uh, as a courtesy, you know, because he is a journalist. I intimated not one bit what I intended to do with it, other than that I had it. This was on a Tuesday, uh, or Monday or Tuesday. Within two days, the story appears in last week's paper. He, I guess, thought that I might jump the gun, release it, and he wanted to get ahead. This was his story. Saturday night, I'm sitting at home preparing for my budget hearings this week. It was Saturday night or Sunday night, preparing for my budget hearings this week. And I receive a very bizarre email at after 11 at night from Mr. Murrow explaining how deeply disappointed and sad he had been in my actions because I had decided not to, last week was reported, have a full-fledged investigation on the part of this council where our resources don't permit it. He proceeded to tell me that I did not care about the children of this city and that I had precipitated his release. I, had, I believe his word was forced his release of the memo, and I had done no such thing. I had, he had called me. I asked for it. I asked for it again. He wouldn't give it to me. I obtained it from you, Mr. Inspector General. I attempted to reverse engineer and find the, 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 uh, the, any nefarious activities. He releases his story and then blames me. Now, this is bizarre. <laughs> and I can tell you that based on airing this, Mr. Murrow will probably do a story on me. <laughs> and that comes with this business. 
we do we this this is kind of cathartic. This comes with the business, right? But this memo came into my possession based on my belief that a reporter had a particular point of view. If he had cared so much about the children of the city, he would have released it to me and I, as I offered under confidentiality. He did not. So we are here. There is a media sensation that is largely founded in fact and reality that our testing security plans across this country in the wake of No Child Left Behind are inadequate at best and there are incentives to cheat. Plain as day. I have not seen systemic evidence in DCPS having reviewed all the reports I have mentioned thus far, but there is a weakness in this system that must be ferreted out and strengthened. And that is the purpose of a hearing that I will start in five minutes. Uh, at the moment, uh, Mr. Grasso and I need to go vote on a tax and revenue matter, and we will return. Mr. Willoughby, I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, I am not absolving anybody of, of anything. Uh, I'm simply trying to put the information out there. I acknowledge that we have a, a cold trail about what happened in 2008, and uh, and we are, and that's where we are. And I look forward to working with you, on Mr. Catania. And again, um, I mean, we labored over the, the recommendations because we too are very much concerned from a programmatic and operational standpoint to make sure that the children receive the right kind of education and the tests are administered fairly. And so I look forward to working with the council as a whole in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Willoughby. Thank you. I, I'm going to uh, recess this roundtable and readjourn shortly for the hearing on the testing integrity bill. Uh, as I mentioned, so in approximately 10 minutes, we will reconvene in that hearing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Testing. Testing.
Good uh, morning, everyone. My name is David Catania. I'm chairman of the Committee on Education. Today is Thursday, April 18th. We're in the John Wilson Building, Room 120. Uh, it is 11:20. The purpose of today's hearing uh, is to have a, a hearing on Bill 20-109, the Testing Integrity Act of 2013. This is a measure that I authored, and it was joined in that with Councilmember Barry and Che. Uh, but by virtue of uh, of this issue. Um, having been circulated for some time, uh, the issue of testing integrity as it relates to the D.C. CAS scores, uh, most particularly in the wake of the, the uh, Inspector General's report uh, last August, which highlighted shortcomings within DCPS's and our other LEA, our local education agencies, uh, uh, systems for testing integrity, I authored this measure to try to strengthen these uh, shortcomings. Uh, at the moment in the District of Columbia, we have no laws nor regulations that prohibit the kinds of activity which are the subject of national scrutiny at the point, at this point. Uh, and so what I endeavored to do with this bill was to build on certain of the improvements that OSI, our Office of the State Superintendent of Education, has embarked on in recent years, as well as look at best practices, uh, at least to the extent that the committee had determined the best practices in other parts of the country. This is a new, in some ways, an emerging area where often testing integrity is left to individual school districts, and so you will very infrequently find state statutes or local statutes on this. But given the seriousness of this issue and the role that testing will play going forward, it's important that we have very, uh, very uh, uh, specific guidelines and consequences. I'm going to briefly mention what the Testing Integrity Act of 2013 attempts to do. Uh, it assigns responsibilities to our Office of State Superintendent, among other things, keeping an inventory of all test materials, securing under lock and key all test materials, and allowing on only authorized personnel to have access to test materials, establishing standards for the monitoring of test administration to ensure compliance with all applicable laws, regulations, and policies, monitoring test administration during statewide tests to ensure adherence to all applicable laws, regulations, and policies, Approving, maintaining, and making publicly available all test integrity plans as adopted by educational institutions. Developing standards for the training of personnel on ensuring testing integrity and security. Providing technical assistance to educational institutions regarding test security procedures. And finally, investigating, documenting, and making recommendations for the remediation of any allegations of failures of test integrity and security, including violations of applicable law, regulations, and policies, and testing integrity plans. Uh, the measure also imposes responsibilities on our educational institutions, like our D.C. public schools and our D.C. public charter schools. Specifically, each educational institution must file a copy of its testing integrity plan with the Office of State Superintendent. The testing integrity plan must include the following. Procedures for the secure maintenance, dissemination, collection, and storage of test materials before, during, and after administration of an, uh, by a, an educational institution, including accounting for lost test booklets, accounting for and destroying old or damaged test booklets, and securing all test materials and, limited, and limiting access to authorized personnel only. 
The bill requires uh, educational institutions to obtain affidavits from the testing integrity coordinator and the testing integrity monitor that state that the educational institution complied with all applicable laws, regulations, policies, and testing in integrity plans within two days of the uh, completion of the testing period. Uh, there are prohibited actions under the bill. Photocopying or in any way reproducing or disclosing test items, including pilot materials or student responses before, during, or after administration of the assessment, reviewing, reading, or looking at test items or student responses before, during, or after the administering of the assessment unless specifically permitted in the test administrator's manuals, giving students answers to test questions using verbal or nonverbal cues before, during, after the administration of the assessment, altering student responses on answer documents, altering the test procedures stated in the test materials manuals, allowing students to use notes, references, or other aids unless the test administrator's manual specifically allows, having in one's personal possession uh, secure test materials except during specified test testing dates, allowing students to use notes, references, or other aids unless the test administrator's manual specifically allows, having in one's personal possession secure test materials except during specified uh, testing dates, allowing students to view or practice uh, secure test items before or after the scheduled testing times, having or, or sorry, making or having in one's possession uh, I'm sorry, um, making or having in one's possession answer keys for secure tests, leaving secure materials in non-secure locations and or unattended by professional staff, and using cell phones, electronics, or computer de devices during testing by school personnel responsible for administering the test. Uh, the bill contains an exception for the prohibitions listed above. If a student has a valid individualized education plan, a 405 plan, or an accommodations are approved for the linguistically or culturally diverse students. Um, finally, we have a test integrity violation section. This section lists some of the, the violations of testing integrity and the sanctions that could be imposed. The sanctions include suspension, revocation, or cancellation of a District of Columbia teaching or administrative credential or teaching certificate, either indefinitely or for a set term by OSI the payment of any expense incurred by the educational institution or OSI as a result of the security breach, and administrative fine of not more than $10,000 for each violation. Uh, the district can consider the following factors when determining what sanctions are warranted. The seriousness of the violation, the extent of the violation, the school leadership's involvement, how and when the violations were reported to OSI, and the actions taken by educational institutions since the violation was reported to OSI. Uh, this is a rather uh, unusual and lengthy recitation of the, uh, of the items incorporated in the Act, but given the significance of this issue and the importance and timeliness of it, I, I wanted to give the public uh, the full breadth of what is hopefully will be covered by this Act and we can learn how to improve it, not only from our public witnesses today, but the continued discussion. Uh, we have been joined uh, at this hearing by two of my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Marion Barry and Councilmember David Grosso. Mr. Barry, who was here first for this particular hearing, I'm going to acknowledge him for a five-minute opening statement, then I'll acknowledge Mr. Grasso, and then we'll begin our public witnesses. Uh, Mr. Barry? Thank you, Madam President, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, commend you, as usual, on leading the way in a very important subject. And I want to welcome those who come to uh, here and to testify. Uh, I can't be here after I make my opening statement because the Children's Trust is up uh, next door. Mr. Uh, uh, Graham, but again, uh, this is a very important situation. Mr. Chairman, since we put so much emphasis in this country on tests, 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 there has to be the integrity of the tests. Now, the question of how many tests we give, et cetera, that's something you and I have talked about, but it's not the subject of this situation. Uh, we sometimes put too much emphasis on tests and results, achievement tests, this test. Sometimes we don't put enough emphasis on it. Uh, we need to look very carefully at any new tests that we are looking for. You and I are in agreement we need to test more frequently. Uh, we need to have different kinds of tests, both diagnostic and prognostic uh, kinds of tests. Uh, and also we have to, uh, in some instances, teach our young people test tasting. Not what's on the test, but test taking. 
Uh, I, I talk to young people every day about various tests, and many of them don't have any idea how to really effectively take a test. Then it's a question of what does the test measure? And so this is right at home with me, and thank you for that. Uh, I think the penalties are uh, uh, appropriate. We ought to take this very, very seriously in terms of the integrity of the test since we want to put so much emphasis on the results of the test. Uh, many of our young people's future, to some extent, is determined by how well they do on this test. That's not the way it ought to be, but that's the way it is in this society. In terms of education in general, as you know, the edu education around the world is improving. The United States is falling way behind, number 18 out of 39 countries, uh, which is out of sound some alone systems. Then within our own United States of America, there are some states that are way, way behind, including the District of Columbia, 51 out of 51 uh, states. And so uh, I appreciate all of this. And uh, you've been bold in your action, as you and I have agreed to do, uh, put aside any whatever philosophical things we have or, or don't have, and think about the children and their parents and their relatives and their teachers and their principals. Etc. So, I'm not. I'm in line with you, Thank you on this one. So, whenever the vote comes, you count me in the yes column right away. Again, let me go next door to talk about another important subject. That's the children's trust, which has been abused over the years. How you doing, Mr. McCoy? <laughs> he uh, he had a child school board. Uh, he, he was one of my my deputy planner at first, and became planner. You know, very bright young man, right? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Mr. Grasso, for your opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Tanya. I um, was going to slip out, but I wanted to come back and uh, just ask, uh, and I'll, I'll be able to stick around for the public witnesses for sure, and I want to hear what, what's on their mind in, this, in regard to this. But I wanted to put on the record that, I, you know, it occurred to me when I asked for the report from uh, DCPS and from Chancellor Henderson, um, that it would also be appropriate that that report include a collaboration between uh, OSSI and the Charter School Board um, because I think they'll all be working on the Common Core efforts as they move forward. What is going to be the uh, scheme or the plan for increased integrity around testing um, as we move forward into 2014 and 15 with these new standards? So. Um, I'll wait till they come up, but I want to ask them on the record if they'd be willing to work closely to uh, do a collaborative report to the committee, like I said, by the recess of the council, which is July 15th, uh, so that we can work on this uh, over the summer to make sure that we're heading in the right direction around testing integrity um, and just get their commitment. So that's why I've come back to hear the public witnesses on this matter as well as um, ask the two government witnesses if they would commit to that effort. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grasso. We'll, we'll now turn to public witnesses. Uh, by committee rules, individuals will be given three minutes to testify. We'll have five-minute rounds from the members. Uh, our first three public witnesses are Al Alexandra Beatty, Ken Archer, and Michael Ms. Uh, Sante. I don't see Oh, here comes Mark. For those who have not appeared before, just please make sure that the mic, that the green light is on. We, we have bolted these um, mics down for some reason, which are which is strange, because we don't bolt these down. I don't know if we trust the witnesses less than the members, and I don't know the wisdom of that. But um, in any event, if you could just make sure you speak as closely to the mic as possible. And we'll uh, begin, uh, begin now. Ms. Beattie. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Alex Beatty. I'm on the staff of the National Research Council, and I'm speaking on behalf of the NRC committee that has been asked to write an evaluation of the progress of the district's public schools under the para legislation, looking specifically at questions outlined in that legislation. Some of these questions require reliance on student achievement data, and because questions have been raised about the validity of some of that data and about whether these questions have been adequately investigated, the committee has explored the state of research and practice regarding test security. My purpose today is to offer a very brief overview of what the committee has learned that seems relevant to the Council's purpose. 
There's a wide range of ways to influence or interfere with test results, which might be seen as lying on a continuum from actions that some teachers may believe to be legitimate support for their students to various means of overtly manipulating results, sometimes in collusion with others. Standardized testing can only produce valid results that can be used to answer questions about student learning if it is conducted with meticulous adherence to the procedures that make it truly a standardized experience that gives every test taker a comparable challenge. Ensuring the validity of test results thus requires a comprehensive approach that has four components. First is prevention, which includes a clear and strict system of test security procedures, but also effective education of all staff involved about these procedures and the requirements of standardized testing, a clearly established culture of professional ethics, and careful consideration of the incentives created by policies that involve the use of test scores, such as employment decisions or financial incentives that are given to teachers for uh, test score performance. Second is detection of problems, which is primarily a matter of regular monitoring for data anomalies, such as results that lie significantly outside of statistical norms. It is important to note, however, that it is not easy to detect all possible methods of influencing results. When possible problems are detected, it is critical that they be thoroughly investigated, number three. Effective investigation requires specific skills, which are not part of the normal skill set expected of educators. It also requires independence from those being investigated. When schools or districts investigate themselves, there is a built-in conflict of interest. Achieving clear resolution of allegations of test security problems is necessary for student achievement results to be trusted and valued, particularly where they are used for high stakes purposes, as I mentioned. Clear resolution involves weighing the evidence according to well understood criteria and imposing sanctions where appropriate. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Beatty. Mr. Archer. My name is Kim Archer. Mr. Archer, uh, do you have prepared testimony? By no, I don't. Okay. Yeah, Please. My name is Ken Archer. I'm a contributor for the local blog, greatergreaterwashington.com. Uh, I, my, the main thing that I want to um, uh, say, uh, Chairman Catania, is that I, while your legislation is good, I think it doesn't get at the core issue here, which is can we rely on Aussie to carry out state-level oversight? Can you hear me? Mr. Archer, is your green light on? Oh, I thought it was, sorry. Can you rely on Aussie to carry out state-level oversight of a uh, school system when the state superintendent uh, reports to the same boss as DCPS? It's, it's a difficult structural issue that we have in D.C., but it's clear that what happened, the, that basically Aussie engaged with somewhat of a cover-up of the potential scope of this cheating. They dumped this information on a Friday afternoon. The decision about when to release um, Aussie's press release, this information, was made by the mayor's press office. It was taken out of Aussie's hands. I called the mayor's press office as a blogger because I was tipped off that this was going to come out on Friday. Pleading with them, didn't release this on a Friday afternoon. In Georgia, when this happened, the state of Georgia released it on a Tuesday. You need to protect Aussie's independence as a state of oversight. And then I was, I was ignored. They did this on a Friday afternoon. The, and then I was shocked to see the quote at the end that this serves as proof that 99.4% of classrooms are playing by the rules. It's clear that structurally we don't have uh, state-level oversight that operates independently from the school systems. And this isn't the only area. There's only so much that the council can do to legislate this problem away because the problem is structural. Um, for example, uh, I wrote last summer about another audit that Austin is supposed to do, which is of uh, the capacity. And it's a totally political motivated audit. The methodology that Aussie uses is constructed in a way to always show that we have universal pre-K. And I called the auditor, and the auditor was willing to say on the record, not only do we disagree with the methodology that Aussie has us use, but we don't believe that, that we have universal pre-K. And this isn't just an Aussie issue. It's also an issue with the, the WIC, the Workforce Investment Council. They're supposed to provide a state level oversight of our workforce development programs at DOES. But the executive director of the WIC and the head of DOES both report to the same person. I feel like this is the structural issue. And until we figure out, and it feels like there's potential solutions out there. And I mean, you know a lot more about public law options here than I do of how we could solve this fundamental structural issue. But, you know, Council Member Brown last year tried, he tried to step in to um, solve some of these issues with oversight of our workforce development programs by, by requiring that ZOES do quarterly reporting of the outcomes of training providers. That's 
actually been a federal mandate under Lewis since 1996, but because we don't have WIC oversight, it doesn't, there's only so much that we can do from a legislative perspective. And I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are in terms of how we can address this fundamental dynamic of providing state-level oversight of educational first of all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Archer. Uh, Mr. Musante. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Council Member Grasso, and staff. My name is Michael Musante. I am the Senior Director of Government Relations for FOCUS, the Friends of Choice in Urban Schools, a 16-year charter school advocacy group here in the District of Columbia. I am here to simply say today that FOCUS strongly supports the Testing Integrity Act of 2013. We have one small one-word change that we would request that you consider um, on page 5, section 5, Testing Integrity Violations. Uh, we would ask that the word, any person who knowingly or willfully, either one, your choice, um, but um, we feel that that would be a, uh, a stronger um, understanding or a stronger explanation of, of, the, of the section. Um, and to just uh, uh, answer Council Member Grasso's uh, question from earlier, in the 0708 school year, DCPS educated 69% of the students in the city. Charter schools educated 31%. In the 08-09 school year, it was 64-36%. Thank you. Um, Mr. Misante, thank you for the suggestion. I think that's a, a good one. Uh, you know, the purpose of these hearings, obviously, is to solicit input from the public. It's also sometimes we cast a wide net. People who don't actually have the time to come testify watch our hearings at home or they read about it in the paper and they... They, that's why we keep the record open to try to fundamentally improve it. Uh, the, the issue of knowing and willful is an important consideration. It's something that I thought uh, we would be able to discuss at the full council in, in, in part, uh, perhaps, you know, criminal co consequences, not just the civil fine. The way the bill was introduced, it did not include, you know, a possibility of a, of, of a lower class misdemeanor. Uh, because it complicates referrals. I mean, it's kind of inside the park stuff, but a bill that would have m multiple implications would have sequential referrals, and we wouldn't actually see the, the end of the tunnel for some time. And so this is a way to jumpstart the process. Um, but I think that's a helpful suggestion. I also am looking at elements about, you, you know, putting affirmative responsibilities on individuals once they become aware of, even if they aren't themselves, knowingly and willingly doing it, but if they become aware of it along the, the lines of child welfare laws where where if a person is aware of it, they must and have an affirmative obligation to tell us. Uh, looking at institutionalizing the, uh, the idea of ethics training and testing integrity training, uh, because right now I, I just don't have a lot of confidence that all of our LEAs, our local education agencies, which include our charters and our public, that they have the, uh, the wherewithal to replicate these rules over and over again and to kind of to, to, uh, to educate in a uniform way the workforce. And so uh, once we get to implementation, I'll be looking to talk to the state superintendent uh, about you know, how we might, DCPS might, actually construct uh, webinars and uh, online opportunities for universal training that are complete with testing components within the webinars so that teachers in the comfort of their own home and testing uh, coordinators in the comfort of their own home or office can learn the rules in one place and have a fighting chance of understanding them and the universal expectations. And of course, at the conclusion, um, you know, there would be a, there would be a simulated there would be a test that they would have to pass in order to have that rule. All right. But again, we're just talking at this point. We're at very early in the process. Uh, Mr. Archer, I appreciate your point of view uh, with respect to some of the you know structural problems with our governance. You know, and how do we strengthen ASI so that, you know, in, in, in the past, frankly, ASI has not been very strong. Um, from a human capital perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, you know, we still are on a watch list in the Department of Education for some of our grants. I mean, so, there, you know, so part of, part of the challenge of getting our government to operate is we need to make sure that all of the, all the aspects are up and running, and then we properly assign those responsibilities. But what we've done is we've, we've worked, we've made these workarounds when the entities that might really be responsible aren't really ready, we try to find these other mechanisms. And that's not necessarily, that's not an indictment under our current superintendent, but that's happened in the past, you know. And, uh, Deborah Gist was a great superintendent. She just came into a system that was radically dysfunctional and under underperforming. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, one idea that we might look at to insulate the superintendent if we wanted to, and again, I don't want a million emails on this because we're just talking, would be to give the superintendent a set term, uh, much like the inspector general has, so that the inspector, or so that the superintendent could only be removed for cause, right. for instance. That might be the counterweight. Some have suggested putting OSI under the role or under the supervision of the State Board of Education where there are separately elected individuals. And when I raise that in some circles, there's enthusiasm and horror in others because, well, well it's a return to the State Board of Education. And so there's no perfect solution, but I think, again, I invite people to continue to, let's continue to talk about how we might do that because I do see there being an in inherent conflict. Uh, and depending on if the chancellor is stronger than the superintendent, the superintendent should be over equally all the 47 local education agencies, DCPS, the 47 charter schools. That should be the mechanism. And if you have a very strong chancellor and a not so strong superintendent, you know, you have a, a, you have a, a right. reverse. Uh, Ms. Beatty, I would welcome, um, you know, because there aren't a lot of examples on statutes from states. And what we're proposing would be among the most robust, at least as far as our research indicates. Um, and I'm very conscious of not wanting to put things in statute that won't wear well with time, that are more appropriate for regulation, that the agencies can change and OSSI can change for itself. Uh, but at the same time, there are some minimum standards on which I don't believe we can have any uh, uh, opportunity for mischief at a, at a state level, at a, at a, at a OSSI level. Uh, you know, is it is who would you recommend the committee to s talk with through these uh, issues? Because I don't know who to go to, right? A national organization that specializes in this this whole testing issue, especially on a national level, is you know less than a decade old, and I and I think we're on the forefront of trying to get it right, and we don't know who to go to to make sure we're doing what's right. Who would you recommend we talk to? Uh, my first thought would be um, the state of New York recently uh, went through some self-examination on this issue and I shared with um, Ms. Prince some materials um, that were created as a result of an audit function that was carried out to look at their entire spectrum of procedures and critique them. Um, and I think that's a very thorough document that would be helpful. I, 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 I'm not an expert in this area, but I think that you're right that um, jurisdictions around the country handle this very differently and that there isn't a well-established norm. I do think the NCME guidelines that were released fairly recently are a useful starting point, and there are some researchers in this area, and I shared some names with Ms. Prince um, that I think might be helpful uh, as a starting good. point. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Grasso. Question. Thank you. Um, just have one reflection, you know, Mr. Archer, I, I hear exactly what you're saying about these structural issues, you know, and it's frustrated me as I've been here for the past three and a half, four months, and um, I, I just, I don't know, I, I hope that you can tie this together with a bigger discussion as well. It's one thing to say, you know, WIC is this, and this is this, it's, un, it's kind of, that's a product of, I think, a bad operational setup for the whole government. and. Um, and if I had my druthers, we would flip the whole budgeting process on its head to try to get to these issues, because I think that's the core of it. When you fund an agency, it has, it has to have a place to go. When you fund an issue, then you have agencies that then become responsible to the issue. Um, and I think conceptually speaking, it would be interesting to hear what you have to thought as you move forward. I, I know um, it's, it's a lot more difficult to come up with a whole structural change to the way we do things in a government, and that might take several years. Um, but I think it would go to the core of what you're saying. So when what Councilmember Catania was saying was was right on, we tend to default to these issues. We tend to default to this is how we do things because we don't like having levels of accountability in certain places where we know it doesn't work. And so the question then becomes how do we flip it all on its head to try to get at levels of accountability to actual issue areas rather than to agencies. Um, does that make sense? Well, I mean, right now it feels like we have the worst possible setup because the executive director of the WIC and the state superintendent both report to the same deputy mayor as the head of the agencies that they're supposed to provide oversight of. Well, I imagine the worst possible setup would be if they didn't report to anybody, but yeah, right. you're right. I mean, it is pretty bad. So, I, and then the only other thing I want to mention is it, as we move forward in doing this, don't forget the power of transparency in these things. You know, the, yeah. the reality is that as you discuss budget, but also as you discuss accountability like this, right. you know, do they ever meet? Do they ever do it in a public way? Is there anybody asking the right questions? All of those things are part of 
really, in my mind, part of good government and transparency, it may not be such a big problem that they report to the same entity if the meetings were public and if um, there was a way to, to see whether or not the questions they were asking had any value at all. Um, so I'm with you on this. I think we ought to dig into it as hard as we can. And uh, like you said many times, Chairman, that, that it's not maybe something we can do right now. Uh, but it is something that we're working towards. Well, the ideas that I'm aware of are staggering the term of the executive director of the WIC and the stage of superintendent of education so that it's not coterminous with the mayor's right. term. Right. Um, having the mayor not appoint them, so having the WIC board appoint the executive director of the WIC, having, uh, and then having the state board of education uh, select the state superintendent of education. Um, both those sound like very good, and then also not allowing either to be let go except for cause. Going in all of the three of those, I think, would, if we were to do in those three things, then I think the council would have to spend a lot less time legislate, putting in this kind of legislation because it would happen naturally. Thank you. Having the once chaired the uh, Committee on Public Services and the Oversight over Department of Employment Services, I agree with your assessment of the Workforce Investment Board entirely, it's off topic here, but um, you know, we have allowed um, the Workforce Investment Board under the Workforce Investment Act is really the authorizer, it's the, it's the decider uh, of you know, which training, what, the, what, what subjects will be trained, you know, what the certification standards are, et cetera, et cetera. Right. It's just never been the case. Right. It's not, never been the case by design because the executive, no matter who the mayor is, has never wanted to really let go of the nearly $20 million at last check of Workforce Investment Act money. That's right. Uh, so we have a show. We That's don't right. have a real Workforce Investment Board. We have a show where the executive is pulling the strings behind the curtains, deciding who the vendors are, how much they get paid, and we have a bunch of compliant folks who are often in the know and, uh, and who, who have very close and closely relationships with the executive who don't want to rock the boat. They're just happy to be invited to dinner, whether they get allowed, That's right. allowed to eat is a whole other story. And so there's this conspiracy here, really. And the results, the proof is in the pudding. When people wake up and talk about our serial levels of unemployment and lack of skilled workers, it's exactly directly attributable to that. I remember having DOES directors who, in my chamber, defended hiring and training Maryland residents in Maryland. Yeah. yeah. I had to make it against the law to use district dollars not to train non-district residents. I had to put that in the law. Right. And it's exactly what you say. Yeah. All right? Yeah. I want to thank each of the witnesses for being here today. We're going to go to our next panel of witnesses, Mr. Nathan Saunders, Mr. Robert Schaefer, Mr. Eric Martell. Mr. Saunders, you are first. So, uh, when you're ready, just uh, please state your name and begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Catania and other honorable members of the Committee on Education. Mr. Grosso and committee staff. My name is Nathan A. Saunders. I'm the president of the Washington Teachers Union. We are the sole collective bargaining unit for public school teachers in the District of Columbia. We represent more than 4,000 active teachers who consistently serve over 45,000 DCPS students daily. The Washington Teachers Union is here to testify in opposition to the Testing Integrity Act of 2013. This legislation will establish standards for the monitoring of test administration to ensure compliance with all applicable laws, regulations, and policies. This is an amicable goal, a marble goal in and of itself. A 2003 study published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics using data from Chicago Public Schools found that serious cases of teacher or administrator cheating on standardized tests occur in a minimum of 4 to 5 percent of elementary school classrooms annually. To that end, in March, teacher and administrator cheating made headlines and 35 school administrators and teachers were indicted by a grand jury in Atlanta for participating in a widespread public school cheating scandal. 
and in an unfortunate incident close to home, several district schools were under investigation in 2011 under Chancellor Michelle Reed when examiners found an unusual number of erasures on DC CAS. There were also alleged testing violations on DC CAS in 2008 and 2009. As a result, the District of Columbia has a reputation for an unstable testing atmosphere. This reputation is a burden on our educational system, its students, and its employees. The testing integrity is clearly an issue. However, the current legislation under consideration is not aligned with the overarching issues that need to be addressed. First, the, T the Testing Integrity Act requires schools to establish test integrity plans with procedures to secure the maintenance, dissemination, collection, and storage of test materials during and after the test administration. The majority of responsibilities under the Testing Integrity Act fall squarely on testing integrity monitors and test integrity coordinators. The statute language is unclear as to whether teachers or administrators will serve in, those posi in these positions. Teachers should be entirely focused on one supreme goal. That's the education of children. Adding miscellaneous administrative tasks of this nature to the already growing number of administrative tasks thrust upon teachers amounts to a significant distraction. Administrative tasks should be the responsibility of the school administration. This legislation should clearly state that the test integrity responsibilities are administrative in nature. Mr. Saunders, your time has expired. If you would please just summarize the balance of your testimony so I can go on to the next public witness, please. Yes, I will, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, for the record, I've submitted uh, my complete testimony. But it is not so much as a uh, disagreement about the legislation. I've included in the uh, testimony ways in which we can improve the legislation. What we want to do is go to the larger issues associated with uh, testing in the District of Columbia, and that is essentially too much focus on testing and too much emphasis on the uh, role test play in uh, teacher evaluations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saunders. Mr. Martell. Uh, thank you, Chairman Catania, uh, members of the uh, Education Committee. My name is Eric Martell, a retired DCPS high school teacher. The Testing Integrity Act of 2013 needs extensive review and rewriting. Several, uh, the fundamental cause of uh, cheating uh, uh, is the problem of using low-stakes tests as high-stakes teacher evaluation metrics, uh, where uh, uh, for both teachers and principals, and also using the, uh, the results to evaluate uh, people in the building. 5% of the overall score, uh, the school value added, uh, is one where everybody is evaluated on the basis of a few students' performance in a few classrooms. Uh, the bill needs to mandate that no teacher administers a test to his or her own students. No principal will hold tests, uh, uh, test results, or, be, uh, or, or testing materials that would affect his or her building. The Atlanta school uh, investigation discovered that uh, in every building where 30% or more of the classrooms were flagged for a high percentage of wrong to right erasures, the principal was cited as one of the 178 uh, staff members that was responsible. Based upon that, I did a calculation using, which you have before you, uh, that would suggest, hypothetically, that an estimate of the number of people who would have been found responsible if the investigation of 2008 had been conducted on the same uh, level as that in Atlanta would find approximately 90 people, 35 principals, 25 teachers, 18 test coordinators, and 8 and 11 others. There's a, there's a misunderstanding about uh, test erasures. I read briefly from the Atlanta inspection report. What, is, what, what do wrong to right erasures show? They do not indi what they indicate is that an external force was involved. It does suggest that something else other than normal student erasing occurred. 
the re responsibility of the agency, of, in, of evaluators, of uh, uh, investigators, is to find out what those causes were. And in most cases, they do turn out to be cheating. And, the, and, and uh, one other thing to mention, is, a few other things to mention, is that um, your, the oversight of this bill should include all schools, DCPS and charter. Uh, and, and I hope that you will initiate another investigation that will reach the same depth of analysis as that in Atlanta. Um, and I, I support, I hope you will support Councilmember McDuffie's request that the IG pr uh, provide the Council with all the documentation of their investigations. Um, and I do, I want to also say along these lines that. Um, Mr. Uh, Your time is expired. Um, Mr. Okay. Your time is that these Mr. things should be, uh, one more thing, should be requested by requests for proposals. There should be public requests for proposals Martel. for investigations. Thank you very much. Perhaps you can complete your testimony in response to one of the members' questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions for this panel? Um, I don't really have any questions. You know, Mr. Saunders, I. It appears to me like what you're saying in your testimony is that you just want to get rid of the impact system and not have any accountability for teachers. So I, I, that really disturbs me. I, I don't see that that's the future of our school system. And we've had conversations before where that didn't come across. And so sure. what, what's this? I don't understand. Okay. Uh, my testimony did not at any time mention impact. Well, uh, but you don't want to have teachers to be held accountable. I mean, you're... you're what my testimony refers to, Mr. Grasso, is the fact that uh, what happens in a, a school environment is the testing coordinator, the testing monitor positions, which the legislation speak to, are positions that are administrative in nature. And my testimony says that a principal, an assistant principal, or a person in an administrative role should have the responsibility of being the testing coordinator for that school. I also make recommendations uh, in the testimony, which I didn't have the opportunity to get to, that testing uh, administrators ought to be switched in terms of school at the appropriate testing time. And I, I do want to make it clear, I think that the school system is moving forward with the, with the reduction on focus on uh, testing, standardized tests. That's a smart improvement by the school system. But the, if we're going to improve uh, quality education, what we've got to do is take the emphasis off of tests. I would hope that we would, in fact, look at some alternative assessments like portfolio assessments in order to uh, judge uh, quality education in the District of Columbia. But again, this con this testimony has nothing to do with impact and I'm not All right. well I just it just felt like that flavor so I hear, I'm glad sure. you clarified what your point is here and you know I don't I don't disagree with you that I think some of these testing provisions do put burdens on teachers and unrealistic expectations um, on teachers um, you know I, I think the solution though is to work together to figure this out and I'm sure. glad that you're willing to do that so definitely and what I desire to do is improve the legislation for example if you look at the sanctions in the legislation what they talk about are sanctions principally against to a large degree teachers you could lose a teaching license you could uh, lose a teaching certification those the legislation speaks to with the assumption that teachers are in fact, uh, in these I mean, capacities. I, I mean, I, you know, I hear what you're saying there. I would, I would love to have all the money in the world and be able to hire an outside firm to come in and do all of our testing, but that's not possible. So sure. teachers have to be engaged in this process and have to do it. And so, you know, that that means the penalties sometimes have to fall on them for cheating, and uh, if they cheat. So, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I can see your point, but I don't see a solution because it's not unlimited funds. Sure. Well, part of the testimony also uh, speaks to the fact that the union does not support any teacher cheating and believes that teachers should be held accountable. But another improvement that uh, my testimony speaks to pertains to uh, the, the fact that nowhere in the legislation does it state that the individual who's involved in the cheating would be terminated from the educational uh, institution. And that's an important component. It does place an emphasis that the ind individual involved in the, in the uh, transgression would be fine, would lose a 
a certification right. or lose a license. But the reality of the District of Columbia today is that a teacher could be in one educational institution and get a job in another the very next day. You could be a D.C. public school teacher and lose a license and go to another uh, local education uh, institution and teach and engage uh, potentially in the same uh, uh, activity. Okay. So I'm making recommendations. I want to see improvements, but I also want to make sure that individuals who look at this piece of legislation as a panacea against the environment that we're all appalled at today, in which is an environment where it potentially some large-scale cheating may have happened or may have been condoned at multiple levels in the District of Columbia. This legislation is part of the solution. It's not the only solution. Thank you for the clarification. There are things that tie into the lower protections, and uh, I would suggest that you request from the Chancellor and the LEOs on the data. You were a frequent witness uh, at our hearings, and I have yesterday and again today given you more time than the committee rules permit. Now, are you going to continue to trespass on these rules and just insert whenever you want and talk as long as you want and answer questions when not asked? That will, un that will upset this relationship because we have given you a long leash on many occasions out of deference to your tenure as a tenure as a teacher and, uh, and, the, and, and your point of view, which is often not the same as this committee. But I will ask you to please obey the rules of the committee, Mr. Martel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Saunders. Yes, sir. I'm a little conflicted by your testimony because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's disappointing in how it starts. Um, it, it seems to suggest at one point that we are too draconian on teachers, and then in response to Mr. Grasso's point, you say, well, it doesn't mention that we should fire teachers. So there seems to be an, an incongruence there. Mm -hmm. we, in other words, it, too much pressure on teachers, too much focus, mm -hmm. and yet the penalties aren't strict enough. Sure. Uh, I think it's fairly clear that this is an even-handed measure that applies to both teaching or administrative credentials. Uh, if you would like it to be more explicit to to incorporate termination, I would be happy to inc incorporate that. Sure. Is that is that your testimony? No, it's not. Th those are your statements. I I'd like to give uh, some comment with regard to that issue. Um, I think that while it is implied that the individual might be terminated, it should clearly state such that this is a, a potential uh, sanction. Uh, nextly, um, there is no effort to uh, encourage teachers or administrators to be fired by my testimony. The focus is to make sure that we understand through this legislation the purpose of uh, individuals who are responsible are individuals directly acting in an administrative capacity. If you look at how DCPS... Mr. I'm Saunders, sorry. just so I'm clear, so do you ever see an accountability moment? You're talking about people acting in an administrative capacity. Is that, does that by definition mean not teacher? No, it doesn't. What does it mean then? It doesn't. It means that the individual, for purpose of this legislation, the individual who is responsible for receipt, administration, and dissemination, and, and uh, of this examination that and we're talking about. That's and, correct. Which includes teachers in classrooms. From time to time, it does. Well, often it does. Because Absolutely. These, these are. This is you know part of our workforce that helps administer the integrity. Uh, helps administer the system and ensure its integrity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I might just rephrase, if I had come, you know, from from your standpoint, what I, the point of view I might have had, and that is, uh, you know, that there are some imperfect systems in place and there is pressure on teachers to cheat, uh, that those are undeniable, but that by and large your workforce, uh, they are individuals of integrity who want to see this done right and who are looking for the tools to make sure it's done right because no one wins when someone cheats least of all the students. Absolutely in agreement. And so, but uh, that's, you know, that's not the way in which, and some, perhaps you may want to go back and reread your testimony. Sure. I read ahead, uh, even though you, 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 you uh, um, uh, were given three minutes, I read ahead to the part that you were not, uh, you were not able to read in the allotted time. And what I don't see is a partner necessarily mm -hmm. in, in the WTU from your testimony. I, I think your membership desperately wants to see this 
uh, this issue resolved because they go to work by and large every day doing their best for students. And they, more than anyone, need a system that has this cloud lifted. So I look forward to working with you and your members to have a system that works. But the tone of which you started the memo, or started your testimony, was a little off-putting. Mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't see, you know, I didn't see that willingness to let's get this right, just what you don't like. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's a mischaracterization, Mr. Saunders. So I'll give you a chance to respond. Sure. There are uh, existing rules and regulations pertaining to testing protocol. But there are no laws. In this District of Columbia, there are no laws and there are no regulations mm -hmm. that specifically prohibit individuals from engaging in cheating or uh, violations of testing integrity. This is what this bill is attempting to, uh, to, 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 to resolve, albeit imperfectly. It's what we're attempting to get to. Sure. And, and we also look at uh, their provisions uh, within Title V of the education law, which uh, holds teachers accountable when they uh, find themselves in a situation where they uh, create an atmosphere of disrepute upon the agency. There are also the ethics uh, provisions that would apply to these types of scenarios as well. So I think what we can do is work together to, to marry the existing rules and regulations as well as some internal things uh, that DCPS has. Every year there's a testing protocol uh, since DCPS has been uh, doing the DCCAS. There are testing coordinators and those things do exist. Well, I want to thank uh, both of you for thank your testimony. You. Um, you know, I, I think we all have a point of view on testing and its role. Sure. Uh, some pref prefer more, some less. Uh, I do believe there is a, a role for testing um, to, to help measure gains, to look where there are additional needs for resources and remediation, and also to give children a, a, a realistic assessment as to whether or not they're on grade level and where they stack versus other children. I think there's a role. Uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in the subject of testing, and we are very new. We're in our first decade or so of this national testing, and we're working out a lot of things, including frequency, duration, weight, and so on, right? So we're working on this. I think as long as we all will continue to talk with one another, we'll, that's important, and we'll try to get us closer to right than we are perhaps right now. Mm -hmm. But I hope, uh, Mr. Saunders, you acknowledge that, you know, there are – you know, that there's no interest on the part of this committee, and I gather from your testimony that you thought perhaps we were being unfair, that the bill that I authored was being unfair for teachers. If I were unfair for teachers, I might have taken an entirely different approach to this hearing. And you understand why. Because the vast majority of the issues, as I have reflected, having read the 09 Cavion report, the 010 Cavion report, the 11 Al uh, 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 Alvarez and Marcel, and the 12 Alvarez and Marcel. The indications that come up are not necessarily principal issues, but frontline teacher issues. I did not want this to be a giant finger pointing episode on what a few teachers have done when I know the vast majority are doing their best in a difficult system. Mm -hmm. I want this to be a, a situation where we acknowledge we have shortcomings and holes in the system. There's no evidence of a widespread concerted conspiracy. Let's fix this going forward. I appreciate both of you being here. Uh, full opportunity for people to continue to reflect and revise and offer different perspectives and different suggestions in this vein. And it's open to everyone who are witnesses and who are not. Uh, and I'll keep the record open on this particular matter for two weeks. So if there are particular suggestions on improving it, we will embrace them, welcome them, and look forward to them. I Thank you. both of you for your testimony. Right. I will now go to the government witnesses. Uh, Mr. Alvarez, not to be confused with Alvarez and Marcel. Mr. Alvarez, you are from the office of the State Superintendent of Education, Desi Rausch. I want to acknowledge that our superintendent uh, has uh, is attending to certain family matters, and that's why she is not here. Uh, you are her chief of staff. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, I want to invite uh, uh, Abigail Smith to come to the table on behalf of Oxy. Oh, I'm sorry, Deputy, I apologize, the Deputy Mayor. Quite all right. 
Um, <laughs> Answer to any. Mr. McCoy, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, you know, I, I won't have any specific questions from you as a chair of the Charter School Board. I appreciate you being here. There may come up a question from a member. Um, you know, if the member has an issue, I don't know what your schedule is like, Mr. McCoy. I do appreciate you being here. If you have to leave, I'll, I'll pull the members to see if they have any questions for me. Okay? Thank you for being here. All right. Um, Mr. Alvarez, um, if you would please state your name sure. and begin your testimony, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Catania, members of the City Council. My name is Mr. Alvarez, and I am the Chief of Staff to Hosanna Mahaley Jones, State Superintendent of Education. I am honored to appear before you today to provide testimony and recommendations on Bill 20-109, the Testing and Integrity Act of 2013. Over the past two decades, there have been a great emphasis placed on statewide assessments, or also known as high-stakes testing, in elementary and secondary education, largely stemming from the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 a federal school accountability law mandating all students to be proficient in reading and mathematics by the end of the 2013-14 school academic year. Test integrity is now part of, of this high stakes testing. The, assess, the state assessment program administered by OSSI is of the utmost importance to the measurement and reporting of the achievement of students and schools in the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia Comprehensive Assessment system also known as the DCCAS is administered annually to approximately 32,000 students in 3rd through 8th grade and 8th 10th grade. Students are tested in subjects of mathematics, reading, composition, science, and biology. In April of 2012, DCCAS was administered in 243 schools across the district. DCCAS scores are used for many high-stakes decisions. In the past, once notified by OSSI, the local education agencies, also known as LEAs, conducted their own investigations. Commissioned by OSSI in March of 2012, Alvarez and Marcel, and again, no relation to, to me, an independent auditor investigated 70 classrooms in both the District of Columbia schools and your uh, public charter schools across the uh, district, flagged for possible testing concerns. Following an analysis of the 2011 DCCAS test results, the review analyzed wrong to right score variations within classrooms and student gains from the 2010-2011. The investigations found 23 schools had violations, three were critical, nine moderate, and 11 minor. DCCAS scores for three classrooms were invalidated out of the 70 classrooms flagged. For the second consecutive year, OSSI has continued testing integrity reviews with a and to conduct investigations. As an added measure, the 2011-2012 DCCAS test integrity evaluation was enhanced along with further guidance to LEAs, enhancing the test administration process. It is with great pleasure that I report that 99.4% of testing groups were found to have no critical violations. This data confirms that cases of impropriety represent a very small percentage. The number of schools with critical findings increased from last year due to the tightened investigatory process. Of the 243 schools or the uh, 2,688 testing groups, only 25 schools, uh, 41 testing groups were flagged for investigation. And of those 25 schools, 41 testing groups uh, 11 schools or 18 testing groups were identified as having critical violations. Chairman Catania, we are in full support of the proposed legislation and we commend you for your attention to this important issue. The Test Integrity Act of 2013 acknowledges the importance of having strong test integrity laws and helps strengthen the work that OSSI and our educational partners have started. In fact, many experts have uh, commented on the groundbreaking work that OSSI has undertaken regarding test integrity. According to one of our technical experts, uh, Professor William Schaefer from the University of Maryland, uh, and I quote, the method that OSSI uses uh, cover multiple ways that testing irregularities can manifest. In the development of their approach and throughout its implementation, OSSI kept its technical advisors informed of their procedures and results and has continually placed considerable resources in the use 
and study of their flagging criteria. As a result, OSSI has a credible and effective process for identification of schools for further investigation. The bill is drafted, codifies process, which closely resembles our current test integrity process. The bill provides a clear breakdown of responsibilities related to test integrity for both OSSI and the LEAs, including a delineation of what must, in, what must be included in every test integrity plan. Additionally, the bill recognizes and addresses a current gap in OSSI's ability to hold integrity violators accountable. This is accomplished by providing OSSI with the authority to restrict, suspend, or revoke administrative credentials and teaching cert certificates as well as levy fines for those who are found to willingly violate the state's, the state's test integrity policies. Finally, the bill provides the mayor with rulemaking authority, which will allow OSSI to develop the state's, implement, the state's implementing regulations in a detailed manner to implement and further strengthen our, our test integrity protocols. While we are in full support of the proposed bill, which largely mirrors our current process, we hope that we can work closely with the committee prior to markup to explore some potential clarifying and substantive amendments. Furthermore, we look f forward to working with the committee to establish additional modernized testing, including online testing. The district has already begun to use online testing for health, for the health component of the DCCAS, and this practice will grow in the coming years. In preparation for this transition, we are exploring the implications on our test integrity tools and procedures and have joined the Partnership for Assessments and Readiness for College and Careers, which is a consortium of 22 states and the U.S. Virgin Islands working together to develop and design the next generation assessment system. In closing, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, on behalf of our state superintendent and the 2100 hardworking OSSI team members, which includes our dedicated bus drivers and attendants, I thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. Uh, Mr. Rausch, on behalf of the State Board of Education. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Catania and honorable members of the Council of the District of Columbia. My name is Jesse B. Rauch, and I'm the Executive Director of the D.C. State Board of Education. I wish to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the topic of testing integrity. With its independence, the State Board of Education seeks to fill a crit critical niche in the district's education governance system as an impartial thought leader and convener. To meet this responsibility, the office seeks to perform three roles to be an office of policy, research, and analysis, to be a convener, and to be a public advocate. I wanted to take an opportunity to, to stress just how critical it is that we have faith in our ability to measure our students' achievement and their growth, growth over time. The DC Comprehensive Assessment System, also known as DC CAS, provides achievement and growth data to inform students, teachers, and parents about student learning. Those assessments also form the basis of the state's accountability framework, which rates the effectiveness of schools and identifies when they need additional support. Because of the important uses of the data to both inform instruction and support accountability, it is important that our test results are accurate, fair, useful, interpretable, and comparable. Given the recent allegations that misconduct occurred in at least 18 schools in the District of Columbia, and that other ju jurisdictions around the country have found cases of test impropriety, assurance that our schools operate under proper policies and protocols is vital. The State Board is taking these issues seriously, and to that end is considering supporting further investigation into testing impropriety. Last night, the State Board of Education held a public meeting where we heard from concerned members of the public, in addition to Dr. Peggy Carr, Associate Commissioner, of the National Center for Education Statistics, and Jeff Noel, the Office of the State Superintendent of Education's Director of Data Management. Jeff Noel from the Office of the S from OSI testified about the preventative measures, detection techniques, and investigative process, among other techniques, that OSI uses to maintain testing integrity. Dr. Peggy Carr expressed support for OSI's res regimen, though she believed there was room for improvement in the monitoring of external factors. Nonetheless, she did share her support for Aussie's method of flagging suspicious assessments. She also described the best practices used by the National Assessment Governing Board in its administration of 
the NAEP exam, also known as the nation's report card, to ensure testing integrity. Those included using multiple methods of investigate, investigation, such as interviewing witnesses, conducting erasure analysis, examining answer documents, and analyzing test results over time, pursuing all allegations of irregularities, even hearsay, and not ignoring any of them, as well as ensuring investigations are conducted by trained professionals. Moving to online testing, which will eliminate some forms of cheating, such as erasures or tampering, but will also require new monitoring techniques, and to also support the creation of a healthy system-wide testing culture in which people feel responsible for ensuring the integrity of the system. We also heard from members of the public that want testing integrity addressed and shared concerns about the culture of testing and how tests are currently used in the district. Likewise, the public shared comments about the Testing Integrity Act of 2013, identifying areas where the legislation may need to be strengthened. Some of those witnesses testified today. Following these comments, the State Board of Education approved a resolution, which you'll find with my testimony, in support of improving testing integrity and accountability. Overall, like other jurisdictions, the State Board sees the introduction of the Testing Integrity Act of 2013 as an opportunity to initiate a discussion on the roles and purposes of testing in education. For example, we may wish to discuss the match between the purposes of our tests and what we are trying to measure. The State Board stands ready to assist the committee with this issue. We exist to provide objective research and analysis and to get public input on state level education issues just like this. In closing, I want to share the word of the United States Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, and he says the existence of cheating says nothing about the merits of testing. Assessment is an important part of the learning cycle and provides critical information about student learning. It is, of course, not an end to itself and should be part of a balanced system of instruction and support for students and teachers alike. I also want to acknowledge that even in the midst of the investigations into cheating, there are many, many teachers who are doing excellent work with children every day. It would be a shame if the actions of a few tainted the reputation of the many individuals who do the right thing every day to improve the lives and prospects of our students. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with your office. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Roush. Uh, Ms. Smith, I know you weren't scheduled to testify. Are there any comments you'd like to make uh, before I turn to my colleague for the first round of questions? Ms. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Catania and members of the Education Committee. My name is Abigail Smith, and I am Acting Deputy Mayor for Education. Thank you for offering me the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Mayor this afternoon on the important subject of test integrity. As you know, my first day as acting, acting Deputy Mayor was just a little over a week ago, so I do just want to take a moment to let you know how honored I am to serve the Mayor and to serve the City in this role. And I'm really looking forward to working with you and your colleagues on the Council to make our system of public education work well for students and families in the District. We are going to submit written testimony that focuses on the broader issues of the previous roundtable. So for purpose of this hearing, I'm just going to make a couple of brief points and then certainly happy to answer any questions. Um, protecting test integrity has to be a process of continuous improvement. And so for that, we really appreciate you th your, your focus on supporting that work, um, Chairman Catania, in, in moving forward this bill, which has the support of the administration. So I want to thank you for that. Um, standardized tests are a fundamental method of assessing how well our students are being served. And I want to make very clear that my colleagues and I will continue to enhance and enforce the district's test security procedures so that we can ensure that our system of accountability is as transparent and reliable as, as possible. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity and, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, Mr. Grasso, we're going to have a 10 minute round. Thank you. Um, Mr. Alvarez, um, first, thank you for filling in. I appreciate it. I know it's not an easy task. But, um, this is important, uh, as you've mentioned. Um, I, I would only have one question for you, and it, you mentioned it briefly in your, in your testimony um, around um, working with a consortium of 22 states to develop a plan around how we're going to ensure testing integrity as we uh, move into this new realm. Of, uh, I guess partnership for assessments of readiness for college and careers is that PARC? Correct. That's the that's, that's what it, PARC. Um, so, 
you might have heard earlier, I think you were here when I was talking with the Chancellor about developing a plan and a strategy for moving forward, especially given the fact that, you know, we're not just changing what we're testing, um, but we're changing, I think, how we're going to be testing these students um, from paper to computer-based testing. Um, and so I, I've asked uh, if you could just reflect on that aspect and what role Aussie's playing to ensure that, A, the systems are up and running in time so that the students can take the tests in an efficient way, and B, what you're doing to plan for ensuring that there's utmost integrity during the process. Thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, Councilman Regrasso. So we are, as I mentioned during my testimony, we are part of the uh, PARC consortium, and we meet as often as monthly, uh, definitely quarterly. We're in the process of finalizing what this test this online test will be um, looking like, and then we will then roll it out to the LEAs after once the PAR consortium um, finalizes the uh, the assessment. When's it supposed to be finalized? We don't have a set timeline yet. Uh, when are we supposed to use it? So we're supposed to use it at the uh, the school year 15. Okay, so you're in so, Yep. Yeah. And, and it's going to be, from what you understand, online, it's going to be web-based? Correct. So you'll need to make sure we have appropriate monitors and computers set up online yep. in every school. The testing, what grades are they again? So it's uh, third through eighth, um, and then at the, uh, at the tenth grade, tenth grade. At the high school. Um, you know, I, I asked the chancellor, and, I, and I'm asking you as well, if you commit to working together to put a report for this committee by our recess, which is July 15th, on um, kind of what the plan is to ensure integrity in the new kind of area. Now, when I asked her that, I understood that she wouldn't necessarily know what the, you know, what it would look like, what the platforms were and everything, but I also made the point that, you know, integrity is inherent, something that we can be looking for on a regular basis. So uh, I'm just wondering if you can uh, commit to helping her, working with her in effort to get a report to the committee by the 15th of July that breaks down, and my staff will work with the committee to come up with specifically what we think should be in this report, so you don't have to guess. But um, really, I'm looking for a level of collaboration that, that I think would be appropriate as we move forward into this new era. Absolutely, and we work with the uh, Public Charter School Board as well. That's great. I appreciate that. And, uh, um, you know, it may be that you are a representative uh, in the park process yeah. that you might have to ultimately take the lead to ensure the public is informed, um, you know, and this committee is informed along the way. Um, because one of the best ways to ensure, you know, credibility of these tests is to be open about how we're going to test them, um, how we're going to ensure integrity. So um, that's something that we can do through the public process to make sure everyone has faith in what we're doing as we move forward. Um, I also uh, want to welcome you, Ms. Smith, to, the, to your new role. Um, look forward to meeting with you and hearing what your vision is for the Deputy Mayor's Office. Um, uh, Mr. Rauch, I just have one question for you. Um, uh, you mentioned in your in your testimony, quote, that you are considering supporting further investigation into testing and propriety in the district. I have no idea what you mean by that. <laughs> what do you mean considering supporting? I, I don't know what that means. Can you try to give me something that's a little clearer? Uh, sure, I'll do my best to. Um, last night at our public meeting, uh, some of our board members discussed uh, as they learn more about what has been uh, released regarding uh, uh, regarding the allegations of cheating in the district, whether or not if there was a need for um, some additional investigation further. Um, I know the committee is not, uh, as uh, Councilmember Catania has shared, that he's not pursuing that at this time. But um, the board suggested that if there was a need for such a deeper look into that, that the board uh, might be interested in doing that and taking on that role. So when are you going to make that decision? I'll have to speak with the board members. Do you know what they'll base it on, the decision? I don't at this time. Okay, so it's just a it, it was random a, comment. It, <laughs> um, I think it's because the board members are, do take this seriously as um, it, it forms the basis of our accountability plan. I, I take it seriously, too. Right. And, I, and I think that, 
saying that you're considering supporting something is just irrelevant. And that if you're going to step up and do something here, then I say get on it, man. Let's do it. Because 2008 was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, evidence disappears. Uh, people forget. Uh, we know how this is. That's why we have a guaranteed speedy trial in this country. And, yeah. um, you know, the reality is, is that to just put it out there that you think there's even a need to do this um, says a whole lot about what your thoughts are, and I think you should be careful about what you're saying. I think what we are in need of doing is, you know, we, this only came up last night as uh, when the council, the, when the board members were discussing this, and we have not had time to look into things such as what would it take to do such an investigation, or how much would it cost? If it becomes a prohibitive uh, measure at that time, then it's not something that we could pursue. If it's something that is accessible, then the board might do so. And, and it's um, my role to help guide them in making that decision. And in the last eight hours, I have not been able to get All right, I'll buy that. That's good. Um, I do have one question for Mr. McCoy, if that's possible, um, if he doesn't mind, if you don't mind. I, I just, it's the same question I've been asking uh, the other, what I believe are responsible bodies Mr. for. So if you'll just permit me. Uh, Come on. Uh, Mr. Smith, if you'll just let Mr. McCoy no uh, take your seat for just a second. Um, Mr. McCoy, if you just identify yourself and then Mr. Grosso, please. Uh, John McCoy, I'm the chair of the Public Charter School Board. Thank you, and uh, thank you for filling in, you know, um, uh, also on short notice with the hearing here. But, um, you know, the question is no different for you than it has been for the other entities. And, and in this effort to try to establish a collaborative effort around, a collaborative approach around testing integrity as we move forward, do you think that the uh, Public Charter School Board and um, I, I don't know if you can speak for Scott Pearson or not, but um, be willing to work closely for July 15th deadline? Is that a reasonable amount of time? Well, since uh, Mr. Pearson worked for us, I think I can speak for him. And I like that answer. Absolutely. We will, we will work with our colleagues to, to respond to your question. Yes. And you understand, I, I will, uh, like I said, have my staff work with the committee to come up with a, you know, a good plan on what kind of report we need to, to make sure we're moving in a positive direction and be as public as we can. Yeah. We look forward to working with you. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. appreciate it. Chairman Catania, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Grosso. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCoy. Um, I want to start with the, 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 the uh, appreciation for the testimony on the part of the executive and the support of the bill. And uh, Mr. Alvarez, you mentioned that you know, so much of what the bill contains, including existing provisions and policies and procedures with an OSSI, and that was intentional because you know, there is something to be said for continuity and stability and trajectory. Uh, the bill, though, has a few, uh, without splitting here, has a few important components that are not at least present part of uh, OSSI's policy, uh, which include the requirement of the, you know, the, the signing of the affidavit that attests to uh, the, uh, the lawfulness under penalty of law that the procedures were followed on the part of the in testing integrity coordinator and also the in integrity monitors. Uh, in addition, the law memorializes you know, the consequences of the testing integrity violations, including the revocation of licensure, possible fines, et cetera. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's a matter of uh, uh, the committee respected the work that OSSI had, uh, had started. We thought we should go a little further in light of what some other states have done. And to be sure, we are, you know, I'll speak for myself and the other members who are active here can speak for themselves. We will be uh, delighted to work with OSSI and the Deputy Mayor and the State Board of Education and anyone else that we believe have good ideas to help improve this process. And I think I've mentioned a few. Uh, one is, you know, looking to have OSSI establish an institutional hotline uh, so that, you know, we know we won't in the future have, have evidence that, well, we didn't know. Um, because that was one of the things that helped facilitate the investigation in Atlanta. Individuals came forward. And I believe OSSI is the right place for this hotline to reside instead of in the 47 LEAs, including BCPS. Uh, I'm looking at the role of OSSI in terms of being a repository of actions by the LEAs when they do confront testing integrity issues so that there would be a report from the 47 LEAs to OSSI when they do, uh, you know, in addition to what is self-reported to OSSI, when they themselves come across issues, especially if we go forward with a, a forced disclosure, even if you're not involved, forced disclosure of, of the testing integrity issues, that OSSI, you know, would be the repository of that information and analyze it 
look at root cause analysis and then use OSSI's position to help inform other LEAs of what has been found and what best practices are. I think that's a particularly good use of OSSI. Uh, I do hope you'll, you'll take the suggestion of having OSSI uh, engage in the creation of the webinar. Now, here's where it gets tricky because we allow, as a concession to our various LEAs, each LEA to submit their own plan for what testing integrity looks like. We establish the floor, not the ceiling. So you might have between two systems different plans, but they would share the same floor. So OSSI could put together a relatively inexpensive webinar that, uh, that would be disseminated to all teachers and administrators through their, you know, their institutional email accounts that have the, uh, the effect of being able to prompt whether or not the individual has taken the course and require that there be a test at the end. And that helps with compliance. You can electronically keep track of if you have 100 teachers, did all of them do it? And also you can include for ease of data, uh, you know, the, the, the confirmation that I'm suggesting, the signed affidavit, can also be done online through, you know, unique identifiers so that OSSI doesn't have to run around chasing 5,000 pieces of paper because the dog ate my homework and I lost this and, you know, whatever, all right? So I, I'm not meaning for this to be the end of our discussion, Mr. Alvarez, but I am very serious about uh, us getting this right. You know, this committee is taking quite a lot of heat because we won't reinvestigate something that happened or I won't uh, ask them to uh, uh, to, to, to open up what happened in 2008. Um, by the way, the mayor is free to call for an investigation. Any, any individual member is free to ask the inspector general or anybody can ask the inspector general. It doesn't have to be me as the committee chairman. But I have responsibility, I believe, to marshal the limited resources that this committee has for the most constructive uses. Fixing this going forward is one of them. And constructing meaningful school reform, which has been the subject of some recent reports, is the other not to mention the shortcomings in this budget. So uh, I look forward to this continued discussions, but I want to leave, uh, I want to I press you on a couple of items in particular. While the news is still fresh on the evidence of the 2012, the notion that we have somehow determined that most of our classes are um, free from, from integrity issues and that we have you know, uh, a University of Maryland professor who gives us a good housekeeping seal of approval. Let me press you a bit on this because it appears to me that our triggers for investigations are rather narrow. That you mentioned them. They include, um, they include, let's see, the right to wrong, sorry, wrong to right answers. They include score variations, which, which in a class, in other words, if everyone had the same score, you could probably guess that, that there was some help going on. And then student gains. I think you also include student retreats, student losses as well. So there are four criteria. In order for, uh, at least as I understand the report, in order for there to be a trigger of a heightened scrutiny, two of those four have to be triggered. In other words, simply having out of sight student gains in and of itself does not trigger an investigation. I, I think this requirement of having two triggers is too high. And I would encourage that to be revisited in 12 while the evidence is still fresh and definitely as we prepare for the 13. And I'd like to, Mr. Alvarez, just give you, you know, an illustration. And Mr. Roush provided some examples about how the NAEP scores are monitored that I think, you know, are helpful. We have nothing to hide. And if we do, we're in the wrong line of business. So let's just do our best to make this as transparent as possible and, in fact, invite some random confirmations, not just a regimented. I like the regimented, right, because you have limited resources. We have to be smart. But there is something to be said for having random assessments. So, for instance, if you were to simply look at score vary, or, you know, student gains as an isolated example, I have the 2012 numbers uh, here. And, and some things would stand out for me. All right, I would look at, and again, this is not assigning uh, a predisposition that something wrong is going on because I have happened to have been in Plummer Elementary and I see, you know, the commitment of the teachers and of their new uh, utilizations of technology to improve reading scores and so on. But it, when I see a 59% increase in CAS scores, I would want to know why. And I wouldn't necessarily want to see whether there were, you know, wrong to right because, you know, it's entirely possible someone stands in front of the classroom and says, these are the scores. So you don't have erasures, right? 
Um, and there are other ways that I've learned that you can statistically challenge this. So if everyone gets all the hard answers right and gets all the easy answers wrong, you know there's a, there's a gig there, right? But I'd, I'd want to know why you know, that school had such a, a huge increase. Similarly, I would look at Stanton that had 143% increase in test scores. And I'd want to know why. Now, again, another school that I've been to, and I can tell you the turnaround there, the focus is extraordinary, and there are legitimate reasons why those test scores are increasing. The role of Pla the Plan Boyan Foundation, the role of City Year, and other. Mm. But you understand my point, Absolutely. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. And, and what I'm looking for is some flexibility that we not put our, we not handcuff ourselves into saying, you have to have two of these four before this kind of big mother may I. I don't think that's really in our best interest. So let's just widen it a bit, let the chips fall where they may, and let's strengthen the system going forward. Now I'll give you a, uh, each of you a chance to respond. Great. Thank you, uh, Chairman Catania. We will definitely, um, as we usually do, we will definitely revisit the uh, flagging methodology, um, definitely for 12, and then we'll look at 13 for sure going forward. Um, on your previous comments, we have established a hotline uh, going forward already. Uh, we're looking uh, at the uh, online uh, Can I interrupt for a second? Yes, sir. Do we, uh, do we distribute, in other words, with the test booklets? Uh, you know, it would be fantastic if we had, because we, we can collect the email addresses of all of our teachers, pretty much. I mean, it's whether they're DCPS or the 47 LEAs, we, we would want to have a roster of who's touching these, and we would have contact information, and we can, in addition to this webinar that explains what the floor is, you know, the consequences, consequences embedded, and a part of that demonstration would be call this number or email anonymously if. Is that, is that part of, of what you expect accomplished this next week when we go into CAS testing? That is correct. All right. That well, is I think correct. That's important. Let me ask you about Aussie's yes. role. Uh, you know, I mentioned perhaps having Aussie with an enhanced role, a reporting requirement of the various LEAs to say this is what we found. All right. Do you believe Aussie is equipped uh, to, to not only assume and evaluate the security integrity reports, but also to evaluate in what role do you think Aussie can or should play in meeting out what the consequences will be. In other words, I may not want to leave it, or in some instances, I may want to leave it to the individual LEA to decide the consequences. What do you believe is the appropriate role of Aussie in determining the consequences? So for the past uh, few years, we've, uh, we've managed the, uh, I think you're referring to the self-reported incidents, correct? Well, exactly, so, or yeah. however you want to identify them as you know, adverse impacts, however you want to yeah. identify so, them. So we refer to those incidents as self-reported incidents, and we work very closely with the LEA to address uh, those incidents. And are those self-reporting required by your regulations, and is that something we might want to revisit? Very similar to what we've done in the hospital and, and healthcare settings, where we require, affirmatively require, the reporting of adverse impacts. And the way in which we inspire the report is by limiting the consequences for those who report. Because what we're trying to do is collect data on the weaknesses of the system, and sometimes people, you know, uh, will be very reluctant to report if it has consequences. So there's kind of a limited immunity if you fess up. Right. As right. a way to learn the gig and fix it for everybody. Just, yeah. just trying to understand. So we, we've made a, a number of changes. One is we, um, the form used to be a, I think we used to call it a violations form. We changed the name of the form from a violations form to an incident report form uh, that invites the individuals at the local school level to to um, to report freely. So that's one. We uh, we review it annually as well. Uh, we don't believe that uh, we will visit it again this year for sure. But um, I think we we have a pretty good handle on the uh, self report incidents as, as it stands now. All right. Uh, well Mr. Alvarez, why don't, uh, between now, I believe you are due back before this committee on Monday for your budget hearing. Yes. Uh, what I would like, um, and I understand it's a short time frame, but I would like uh, incorporated in your remarks uh, how we might review uh, and revisit flagging. And I appreciate the personal uh, situation of our superintendent. I also would acknowledge that whatever you would provide to the committee would be preliminary yep. in nature. But I'd like, uh, I'd like to have an understanding about how we will flag going forward, okay? Got it. Um, you know, and, and it might just be good brain food to send someone through the proficiency growths uh, that are the subject of the most recent one while the data is in your custody to confirm. Because just as we had some rapid increases, we had some schools 
with some pretty substantial decreases. And I would want to know why, you know. And again, I think what's helpful here is, I mean, we're so focused on who's cheating, and that's important. But I think we ought to be able to, and the appropriate use of our state superintendent is to look at the data for evidence of why things increases and decreases, why they happen, and use those as roadmaps and what we might want to replicate to have, if they are authentic, legitimate gains, how, you know, reverse engineer, how did that happen, and share it. And conversely, when I see Drew's numbers decreased by, you know, 33%, I want to know why. You know, regardless of cheating, I want to know why. That seems to me more in tune with what's going on in the classroom. All right. Um, so I look forward to your testimony on Monday. I want to thank everyone. This has been a long morning. We are in the middle of budget, so I appreciate everyone has a, you know, three or four day jobs in the middle of budget to get things straight. This is kind of comes. Uh, in addition to those responsibilities, but it can't be ignored. And um, I went in by saying, you know, anyone in this government or any private citizen is free to pursue additional investigations to their heart's content. I don't need to suggest or diminish anyone from making that choice. Uh, I, I, though, am making a conscious decision with the limited resources I have to improve this going forward. And, uh, and you know, we'll leave that at that. All right? Uh, at 10 before 1, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you.